on C-SPAN. The safety of public school lunches was the topic of a congressional hearing last Tuesday. Officials of the Agriculture Department, the FDA, and the National Food Processors Association testify before a joint meeting of two Senate and House subcommittees. Illinois Senator Dick Durbin chairs the hearing. It's just under three hours. Thank you for waiting. Right this is great. Hi, Jan. How are you? Good to see you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I apologize that the floor votes came at uh, an inappropriate moment, but as uh, my colleagues will tell you from California and Illinois, it is our first responsibility, and I'm uh, glad to be with you all now, even though a little bit late. I want to welcome you to today's joint hearing before the Senate Subcommittee on Oversight of Government Management and the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, and intergovernmental relations, focusing on kids and cafeterias, house safe or federal school lunches. I want to thank the members of the House Subcommittee for joining us. This is not unprecedented, but it's rare, and I'm glad that we could get together on a bicameral and bipartisan basis. Each school day, 27 million children eat lunch provided through the federal school lunch program. Despite increased attention in recent years to the safety of the food served to kids, there's evidence of serious safety problems. A series of articles published by the Chicago Tribune last December highlighted many managerial and organizational deficiencies that result in unsafe or contaminated food being served to our kids. A significant problem, it seems to me, is that school officials are many times unaware of the identity of the food manufacturers and processors which are supplying the food they buy to serve the students. Before food ever winds up in school cafeterias, it must first work its way through a complex tapestry of manufacturers, subcontractors, distributors, and brokers who each have distinct roles in preparing and marketing food as it travels from farm to school lunch table. We have a chart here, Marianne, chart number one. This is not a subway system. This is um, an effort to try to chart out how food moves from its source into the school cafeterias. School officials generally don't know, generally know the distributor who's the final link in the chain, but they may not know the manufacturer that supplied the food to the distributor. School officials are also many times unaware of the food safety records of companies supplying food to their school lunch programs. Data on school safety via pardon me, on food safety violations is kept by federal food safety agencies but not readily available to schools who purchase a large proportion of the food they serve our kids. School officials have no way to determine if their suppliers are consistently complying with federal food safety laws. Federal food safety agencies must find a way to inform school officials when food companies continually maintain a poor food safety record. Many Americans may be surprised to discover that our federal food safety agencies don't have the ability to mandate the recall of contaminated food. Instead, in, instead of having the authority to recall the contaminated food, the USDA and FDA must rely on voluntary cooperation by the food companies to pull contaminated food out of supermarkets, restaurants, and even school cafeterias. The only way to ensure that contaminated food is removed from the market quickly is to give the federal agencies mandatory recall authority. When examining the increasing trend in foodborne illnesses in school, I can't help but revisit a problematic issue that's concerned me for years, and I will summarize it briefly. Twelve different federal food safety agencies, 35 different federal food safety laws, 26 different committees and subcommittees of jurisdiction on Capitol Hill. We're lucky to have the safest food supply in the world because that food supply is in a bureaucratic tangle. Chart number two here, I think, will show you some of the problems uh, that we run into when we apply this just to the cafeteria. As you can see, as someone looks at it, the servings in a cafeteria, they're looking at apples and fruits regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, ham, beef, and poultry regulated by the USDA, meat pizza regulated by the Department of Agriculture, veggie or cheese pizza by the FDA, lettuce and vegetables by the FDA, chicken, turkey, regulated by the USDA, and fish, regulated by the FDA and other agencies. It goes on and on. Try to explain it. There's no good science behind this, only political tradition. 
I have some legislation in that uh, Senate Bill 1501 that moves us toward a single food safety agency, which would address some of the very serious uh, shortcomings of our current situation. Based on what we learn in this hearing, I'm going to be working to draft legislation that would direct the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, to require distributors and other suppliers who contract with schools to provide schools with the identity of the manufacturers, subcontractors, and other suppliers who supply food to the school lunch program immediately upon a school's request. We should know the chain from the farm to the school cafeteria. Second, to direct federal food safety agencies to share information on food safety records of suppliers with school food service officials. Third, direct the USDA to provide technical assistance to schools that like to use the FDA, pardon me, USDA's food safety procurement specs in their own contracts with suppliers. Fourth, provide federal food safety agencies with mandatory recall authority over food purchased by schools. Five, require the USDA to develop voluntary food security guidelines for industry to follow to pr better protect the general food supply. I encourage my colleagues to join me in this effort, not only to consolidate food safety functions, but also to better protect our nation's children who participate in the federal school lunch program. I would now like to recognize from Long Beach, California, Congressman Stephen Horn. Thank you for joining us. I might add that you have a brother in my constituency. That's right. He's one of your fans. That's right. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today with Chairman Durbin, and uh, I believe Senator Voinovich is going to come. Uh, this hearing has been called to examine the adequacy and efficiency of the federal oversight of the National School Lunch Program. This important federal program provides meals in more than 97,000 public and nonprofit private schools and residential child care facilities. The program, which is administered by the Food and Nutrition Service in the Department of Agriculture, offers nutritionally balanced, low-cost or free lunches to more than two million of children each school day. The Department of Agriculture denotes about 17 percent of the program's food, including beef, poultry, fruits, uh, vegetables, grain, and dairy products. The department seeks to ensure the safety of this food through its procurement policies and procedures. For example, the department's contracts with meat suppliers require suppliers to adhere to provisions of the Federal Meat Inspection Act. The remaining 83 percent of the food provided to the school lunch program and all of the food served in the school breakfast program is acquired by the local school food authorities through private contracts with suppliers. Although the Department of Agriculture has its own policies and procedures to ensure for uh, food uh, safety, there are no mandatory national standards that apply to the nation's schools. An additional problem is uh, created by the number of federal agencies that are involved in food safety. Currently, 12 separate agencies in two departments, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services, oversee the nation's fo food safety network. Despite that oversight, in 1997, the most recent national data available, there were 20 outbreaks of foodborne illnesses. Of those 20, eight were associated with food served in the school meal programs. In a February 2000 report, the General Accounting Office, the group that we depend in the Congress to do bipartisan research, and it's headed by the Controller General of the United States. He has a term of 15 years, and therefore nobody can touch him. And that's the way we want to keep it. The, so the GAO found five cases in which USDA donated food had to be recalled. And in 2001, 1,200 children in at least seven states were sickened by the tainted burritos served at the schools. The federal government created school food programs to build strong bodies. The government must ensure that the food it provides also builds 
healthy bodies. I welcome our witnesses today, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman Horn. It's my pleasure now to introduce my colleague and friend from the state of Illinois, the ranking Democrat on the House Committee, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Thank you, Senator, my Senator, and Representative Horn for holding this hearing. It is significant that this hearing is both bipartisan and bicameral because it emphasizes the importance we place on our public schools and protecting the health of our children. The federal role in safe food dates to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act nearly 100 years ago. Congress declared that safe food was a national priority. Food safety in public schools now more than ever before must be a national priority. During the five years from 1990 through 1994, for example, Illinois authorities reported only three school food outbreaks in which 66 children were sickened. But during the next six years, the average annual number of Illinois school food outbreaks more than tripled, and the number of youths affected increased tenfold, state records show. Over the last century, the labeling and inspection of food has become an extensive and complicated business, as these charts have shown. The local school kitchen with cooks who made large batches of food from scratch have been replaced by a heat and serve institution that serves prepackaged meals. The web of suppliers, producers, and regulators in the food service industry have left local officials in a difficult place and have put the health of our nation's children in jeopardy. Local officials are responsible for the safety of the children in their school, but often don't have the necessary information to make well-informed choices. Local officials cannot distinguish a supplier with, a good health, with good health records from one with a history of health violations. The white flour tortillas suspected in 1,200 school illnesses in 1998 were produced in an unmarked factory in Chicago, for example. FDA inspections from 1996 to 1997, which are done under contract with the Illinois Department of Public Health, noted sanitation deficiencies there, but that plant was not inspected by any food safety agency during the eight months in 1998 when it produced the tortillas linked to the school food outbreaks. Following a flurry of inspections prompted by the outbreaks, the plant was not inspected again until the summer of 1999, although it continued to supply school food manufacturers. In today's hearing, we'll hear about specific cases of illness that resulted from foodborne diseases, and we'll hear about large-scale outbreaks across several states, all within our public schools. Once a foodborne illness is identified, it's often difficult to trace back to the source. The complex, complex nature of packaged food production results in ingredients coming from a wide variety of sources. Any single ingredient can be the source of the illness, and yet food manufacturers often cannot provide investigators with the source of the ingredients for a specific batch of food. One of the lessons from today's hearings is that students in public schools are being served prepackaged foods, and they need more federal protection than ever before. The interstate nature of the food industry, and particularly food delivered to our public schools, requires continued and vigilant federal food safety guarantees, enhanced food inspection and track tracking as essential. Our food inspection program is arbitrary. Food monitored by the Department of Agriculture is inspected daily. Food inspected by the FDA is not. This is one of the problems Senator Durbin's bill would resolve, and Representative DeLauro has introduced the companion bill in the House, and I am proud to be a co-sponsor of her bill. However, there's much that can be done by the agencies now before we even pass the Food Safety Act. One of the key ingredients in making school lunches safer is to provide local school districts better information with which to make decisions, and this could be done today. The USDA has a great deal of information about inspections that it conducts. It then uses that information in deciding what companies will get USDA contracts. Unfortunately, local school districts don't have access to the same information about food providers. They often buy unknowingly from firms with a long history of safety violations. Until the Food Safety Act is law, I would like to see the USDA and FDA work together to provide local school districts with a comprehensive database that could be used in awarding school lunch contracts. This database would include the same information the USDA uses in its contracting decisions. In addition, it could include information from the FDA on inspection and compliance. In other words, the federal government should be providing not just money and goods to local school systems, but the information they need to protect our children. 
With all the concerns they have today, parents deserve a federal guarantee that the food their children eat at school is safe. Ask any parent if it's worth the cost, and they will tell you their child's health comes first. They're right, and the federal government has a major role to play. Again, I thank you, Chairman Durbin, um, Senator Voinovich, when uh, he comes, and Chairman Horn for holding this hearing, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Thank you, Congresswoman Schakowsky. Uh, our first uh, witness here is uh, my colleague and friend from the state of Connecticut, the 3rd District, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Uh, she and I have worked together on this issue for a long, long time, and I'm happy that she came to join us at this uh, hearing. She's the lead sponsor of the Safe Food Act of 2001 in the House, identical to the legislation I, I mentioned earlier. Thank you for joining us, and please proceed. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I might add, uh, my, to my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Horn, uh, that uh, Senator Durbin has relatives uh, really truly all over the country. His daughter is at school in my district in <laughs> Connecticut. So This is uh, not a national campaign. This is a national campaign. <laughs> Indeed. I, I just I want to say thank you to you, uh, uh, Senator Durbin and uh, Congressman Horn and Congresswoman Schakowsky uh, for holding this hearing. Um, this is such an important issue, and I would just say to, to, to Chairman Durbin, he served in the House on the Agricultural Appropriations Committee. He has truly been a consistent voice on the issue of food safety, and I think we owe him a debt of gratitude for that effort. It hasn't been, you know, for a shock value or just, you know, every now and again. It has been years in terms of trying to focus on this issue and, and making sure that our children and our food supply is safe. Uh, the National School Lunch Program was established to improve children's nutrition, to increase lower-income children's access uh, to nutritious meals, and to help support our nation's agricultural economy. On an average day in 2001, more than one of every two children in America ate a school lunch program meal. My own state of Connecticut, 1,093 schools. 272,000 students participated in the program. The school lunch program is a key component to the health of our children, and we need to ensure that the food that they are eating is safe. There's no question about how important this program is. We need to remain vigilant to ensure that the uh, safety of the food that is served to our kids. Uh, it's a special concern because foodborne pathogens that might only mildly affect an adult could seriously stricken or even kill a child, as we have known individual cases, whose immune system has not fully developed. I had a personal experience with this problem. When I was a child, at two years old, I contracted salmonella, a foodborne illness. I was put in the hospital and quarantined for several days away from my parents and my families, and I understand the devastating effects of that foodborne illness. I'm told, though I don't remember, by my mom, and I guess my personality traits were being developed at age two, that when I left the hospital, because I hadn't seen my parents for probably 12 days, that I was absolutely hostile to them because I thought that they had abandoned me. So it's uh, uh, in addition to which what it uh, physical uh, damage uh, that the illness does. Uh, in a February 2000 GAO report concluded that, quote, few outbreaks of foodborne illness were reported in the school lunch and school breakfast programs. At the same time, I understand that the Chicago Tribune reported last year that there's been a 56 percent increase in school food outbreaks from 1990 to 1997. It's important at its very fundamental level uh, and imperative that we determine the scope of this problem. To further ensure the safety of our children, we must address the issues. Let's get the numbers straight. Let's find out what those numbers are. As the Tribune series reported last year, some schools no longer prepare their meals from scratch. According to the series, 15 percent to 20 percent of schools currently contract out their lunch programs. Meals are factory frozen, pre-plated, manufactured according to a portion size and nutrition requirements of the school lunch contracts. As a result of these techniques, harmful pathogens can contaminate these food tra uh, trays and sicken more children. The largest cases of foodborne illness have included 400 children sickened by Staphylococcus aureus and spaghetti in 1996, and the 213 students sickened at 23 Michigan schools from strawberries co contaminated with hepatitis A. We should also be concerned about the conditions of the cafeterias where these meals are served. Again, 
the Chicago area, uh, using the Chicago area as a case study, the Tribune provided vivid examples of unsanitary conditions, unsafe food handling practices. An inspector found wastewater that had spilled from a leak in a freezer at the North Side Pier School, soiling several cases of frozen hamburger patties. Rather than get rid of the food, the inspector instructed the lunchroom manager simply move the patties to another freezer. Other problems include rodent infestations or droppings in areas where food is prepared, peeling paint in food storage preparation and storage areas. In some cases, the peeling paint contained lead, which, as we know, can cause brain damage in children who eat it repeatedly. These are only some of the examples. If this is the case in Chicago, it's probably occurring all over the country, and we know that something must be done. Another concern is the current federal oversight of the, of the uh, food in the school lunch program. While the school lunch and other federally assistance meal programs are administered, by the Food and Nutrition Service at USDA. The safety of school meals is monitored by USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service and the Food and Drug Administration. FSIS is required to ensure the safety of all meat, poultry, and some egg products, and FDA is responsible for all other foods, including fruit, seafood, vegetables, and other products. As a 2001 GAO report stated, and I quote, the current food safety system is a patchwork structure that hampers efforts to adequately address existing and emerging food safety risks. Further, and I quote, the resulting fragmented organization and legal structure causes inefficient use of resources, inconsistent oversight and enforcement, and ineffective coordination, which together hamper federal efforts to comprehensively address food safety concerns, end quote. Even if contaminated food is identified, neither FSIS nor FDA has the ability to order mandatory recall of the product. Instead, both agencies can request manufacturers to start a recall voluntarily and announce if a manufacturer has started a recall to keep the public informed. But as the GAO again reported, quote, the announcements do not include detailed information, such as whether the recalled food was delivered to a USDA food assistance program or was USDA do uh, donated food. In addition, in some cases, because of record-keeping flaws and a complex distribution chain has been, has been pointed out, USDA cannot trace back the product to its original source. In response to an outbreak of E. coli at a school in Minnesota, the Health Department reported, quote, USDA cannot positively say what beef was used in the hot dish and which plant it came from. Uh, the articles point to a Georgia-based supplier um, uh, who ha they had no idea which schools the distributors were serving. Such records are considered confidential, um, they, uh, 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 people were told. How can we address these critical issues? First, schools must be given the tools that they need to make sure that the food that they serve is safe. This includes ensuring that kitchens and cafeterias are clean and training food services uh, employees. Uh, are, these folks are trained in the safe uh, handling of food. The uh, Tribune again uh, talks about dirty kitchens, improperly handled food, and undercooked meals. Uh, this should serve as a wake-up call uh, for action for all of us. Ensuring that foods are properly handled from the farm to, in this case, the cafeteria is critical to the safety of our children. We can do more at the federal level. We need to consolidate and streamline the number of agencies and committees that are responsible for protecting our food uh, and put authority in one Food Safety Administrator. Uh, I've had the honor of introducing the companion bill that Senator Durbin talked about uh, in, in, in the House, uh, and it would transfer all food safety activities to this new agency. Currently, the bill has 43 bipartisan co-sponsors who believe this is the right thing to do. By in, in our numbers, not a lot, but I believe if these reports get out and that if people understand what is happening out there uh, with food safety, that they will be on the phone, write those letters, flock to House members' offices and senators' offices to say, sign on to this legislation. We need to give USDA and FDA the authority to conduct a mandatory recall to ensure that contaminated food does not make it into the school cafeteria. In looking at recent data, in some cases, USDA has only been able to recover a small part of a contaminated product. For example, in 2000, one company initiated a voluntary recall of 22,000 pounds of ground beef tainted with E. coli. The case is still open. So far, only 10 pounds of the product have been recovered. We need to be able to move swiftly, and I believe giving USDA and FDA the authority to institute a mandatory recall would do that.
Finally, we must maintain the zero tolerance salmonella standard for ground beef used in the school lunch program. A recent PBS frontline program entitled Modern Meat. Uh, it was aired on April 18th, 2002, and I ask that the transcript be included in the record of this, of this hearing. Without objection. Thank you. Um, watch this documentary. Truly watch this documentary. The program described numerous challenges that we face in ensuring the safety of our meat supply. The story of Supreme Beef, a manufacturer who was supplying as much as 45% of the meat for the National School Lunch Program. In 1999, the company failed USDA salmonella standard three times. In the first instance, almost 50% of its meat was contaminated with salmonella. Rather, and rather than cleaning up its act, Supreme Beef sued, alleging that the government created arbitrary and onerous standards. USDA lost the case and consequently, and in my view, its ability to enforce this critical standard. As a result of the verdict, Supreme Beef kept supplying the school lunch program until they failed yet again in another round of salmonella tests in June 2000. We need to appeal the Supreme Beef case and we need to get back the kinds of authority in our agencies that are responsible for these issues. Uh, US, in, USDA instituted a zero tolerance standard in response uh, to this effort uh, and that's only for the school lunch program. It can go elsewhere and not have a zero tolerance for salmonella. As a result of the standard, USDA rejected millions of pounds of ground beef that was to be used in the school lunch program. Yet in the spring of last year, the department post proposed to reverse course and sample for other indicated organisms to identify contaminated pro uh, products. Uh, we, a number of us thought it was the wrong thing to do. Working with Senator Durbin and others, uh, the zero tolerance standard was maintained and the secretary um, uh, reversed uh, the, the issue. Uh, it is a critical component to the safety of the food used in our school lunch program. Our children need to be able to sit down and have their lunch and know that everything is possible. The school personnel needs to know that everything possible is being done to keep this food from contamination. Parents need to be assured that this food is free from contamination. There is no higher priority than the safety and the health of our children. This hearing is not taking into consideration the whole issue of imported beef products, inspections. It's a whole other area uh, which is one that needs to be discussed as well. I know I've gone on much longer than my time allotted here, and what I I thank you very, very much. I look forward to the opportunity of working with my House and my Senate colleagues on this issue. We could have no higher priority. Thank you very, very much, and I beg your indulgence. Thank you very much, Congresswoman DeLauro. You told us a little bit about your background, but you failed to mention your connection with food through your mother's bakery. That's right. <laughs> A pastry store for over 50 years in the Italian-American community in New Haven. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. We are fortunate to have two excellent panels. The first, the public panel, I'd like to invite to come to the uh, table. Lawrence Dykeman is the Director of Natural Resources and Environment for the United States General Accounting Office. Lester Crawford is the Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, and the Honorable Elsa Morano. Dr. Morano is the Under Secretary of Agriculture for Food Safety for the United States Department of Agriculture. Thank you for coming. It is customary in this uh, committee to swear in the witnesses. Once you're in place, you can raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. The record will reflect that they have answered in the affirmative. I don't know what we'll do if anybody ever refuses that, but we'll wait and hope that never happens. I'd like to ask you each to limit your oral statements to no more than five minutes. And then we'd like to ask some questions as a follow-up. Mr. Dykeman from the GAO, would you be kind enough to start with your uh, oral testimony? <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Durbin and Chairman Horn, and I want to thank you for inviting us to testify today. Um, much of my introduction has been covered by other, by, by the Congresswoman and by your opening statement, so I'll try to be brief. Um, we know that there are 27 million children that are provided low-cost or free meals daily through two federally funded programs, the National School Lunch Program and the Breakfast Program. Both are administered by uh, USDA through its Food and Nutrition Service. Uh, these programs cost the government approximately $8 billion a year. Most of it is, is, 
is, comes from USDA's reimbursements to schools and the rest in the form of food donated by USDA. <clears throat> and as members of this subcommittee are painfully aware, uh, while the U.S. enjoys a relatively safe supply of food, according to CDC, each year 76 million people suffer from foodborne disease, 325,000 are hospitalized, and unfortunately 5,000 die. CDC also shows that in the decade in, in, from 1990 through 1999, there were nearly 300 reported outbreaks of foodborne illnesses that occurred in schools. These affected over 16,000 people, and the vast majority of them have been children. These reported outbreaks, though, while only a small fraction of overall illnesses, are of particular concern because, as we know, children are much more vulnerable to disease-causing pathogens than healthy adults. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the CDC outbreak data. There were 292 outbreaks in total between 1990 through 1999. On average, 17 outbreaks occurred in the first four years, 29 in the next four years, and 57 in the last two years. CDC officials attribute much of the increase in the last two years to improved data collection procedures that the agency started in early 1998. However, even accounting for CDC's more active surveillance approach, our analysis clearly shows an increasing trend in the number of foodborne outbreaks in the 10-year period. That increase averages to about 10 percent each year, but it does mirror the outbreaks occurring in the general population. It's important to note that CDC's data also includes outbreaks associated with foods brought from other home, from the home or other sources. So we wanted to get a better understanding of this and we examined the 20 largest outbreaks that occurred in schools during the last two years, and we found that about two-thirds of these large, these largest outbreaks were caused, indeed, by food served through the school meals program. Now, I'd like to briefly turn to two recommendations we made in our February 2000 report on the school meals program. The first one, we recommended that USDA establish a database to track all of the actions taken to remove or replace or dispose of USDA donated foods that could, be, could potentially cause foodborne illnesses. And I'm happy to say that USDA has implemented that recommendation. Our second recommendation talked about USDA revising its school, the school food service manual to include guidance regarding safety provisions for procurement contracts that state and localities could also use. USDA recently told us that it plans to address our recommendation by partially revising its guidance, its procurement guidance to schools. We believe they could even provide more information to schools in this regard. Now, in the short amount of time we had to prepare for this testimony, we did some limited review work and we identified two additional issues that we think warrant further study and might help in this issue. First, on the donated portion of the school meals program, USDA procurement officials have routine access to the federal inspection and compliance records of potential suppliers. And they told us they take these records into account before they consider contracting for donated foods. But because the vast majority of food, as we have mentioned, comes from the state purchases and the local authority purchases, it would be very helpful for them, we believe, to have access to this information also. Secondly, we observed that while USDA has an established process for holding and requesting recalls of the USDA donated foods when they have safety concerns, uh, sharing this process with states and localities, we believe, would also be in the best interest. Now I'd like to address, as I was asked to do, some measures taken since September 11th by USDA and FDA to protect the food supply and hence meals served to school children from potential acts of deliberate contamination. Uh, as we testified last October, recent events have raised the specter of bioterrorism 
as an emerging risk factor to our food supply. We stated further that under the current structure, there are questions about the food safety system's ability to detect and quickly respond to any such event. Since then, FDA and USDA officials have told us that they believe they are better prepared to detect and respond to such an event. They are in the process of conducting risk assessments to determine where in the food supply things are most vulnerable. In addition, FDA has issued voluntary guidelines to sectors of the food industry that it regulates to enhance, among other things, the physical security and processing and storage facilities. USDA is working on such guidelines, but hasn't issued them yet. Also, both agencies told us that they've placed their field personnel on heightened alert. I see my time is running out. I just want to reemphasize something that the Congresswoman stated, that we indeed have a patchwork system uh, in, the food safety, in the food safety structure in the federal government. If we had to start from scratch, we would never build the system as it exists today. Clearly, if we want to make a long-lasting improvement in the safety of our food, our nation's food, uh, I believe, and, uh, and at my agency has said this on several occasions, what we need is a single food safety agency, and we have to re-examine the legislative authority uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank I'd you happy very much. to answer any questions. Thanks, Mr. Dykeman. Dr. Crawford? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittees. I am uh, Lester Crawford, Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to discuss the safety of federal school lunches. Ensuring the safety of the food supply is a top priority for FDA, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the administration. I'm pleased to be here today with my colleagues both from GAO and uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I appreciate this opportunity to explain FDA's role with regard to the safety of federal school lunches and the food supply in general. I would like to describe FDA's role in responding to reports of foodborne illness and our collaboration with other federal, state, and local agencies and to mention some of our recent food safety efforts that are directed toward children. As you know, FDA, as a unit of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, has responsibility for all of the food supply with the exception of meat, poultry, and egg products, which are regulated by USDA. FDA's jurisdiction covers approximately 80 percent of domestic and imported foods that are marketed in interstate commerce. The agency seeks to ensure that these products are safe, nutritious, wholesome, and properly labeled. FDA has jurisdiction where food is produced, processed, packaged, stored, or sold. In addition to jurisdiction over food establishments, FDA's purview also includes approval and surveillance for new animal drugs, animal feeds, and all food additives that can become part of food. USDA administers the federal school lunch program. FDA is not involved in the procurement of foods for this program, however, FDA works closely with USDA and other federal, state, and local agencies when reports of illness related to foods in the school lunch program are received. FDA's various food safety activities all help to ensure that food served in school are safe. Our food safety activities include, but are not limited to, research, risk assessment, outbreak response, development of preventive controls, inspection of domestic and imported food, enforcement and development of educational materials for consumers, health officials, and industry. FDA recognizes state and local governmental jurisdictions as having primary responsibility for the regulation of the retail segment of the food industry. FDA provides assistance to local, state, and federal governmental bodies to ensure that the food that is provided to consumers by retail establishments is not a vehicle for transmitting foodborne illness. The agencies publish a model food code that represents FDA's best advice for a uniform system of regulation to ensure that the food sold or offered for human consumption in retail outlets, including schools, is safe, properly protected, and honestly presented. Many jurisdictions have adopted FDA's food code or an amended version of it as their regulatory standards. Our responsibility for responding to foodborne disease outbreaks is shared among local, state, and federal governments. Local and state governments are often the first to detect the occurrence of an outbreak and initiate an investigation. It is important to note that many episodes of foodborne illness 
are addressed exclusively at the local or state level. The role of the federal agencies in large or complex multi-state outbreaks is to assist the state and local agencies in preventing additional cases of illnesses from occurring. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, another agency of the Department of Health and Human Services, through its surveillance systems, detects and investigates outbreaks of foodborne illness. CDC also assists federal, state, and local agencies in investigating outbreaks. FDA becomes involved when FDA-regulated food products may be implicated. Our objectives in outbreak investigation and response are verification of the association with a regulated product, identification of the source of the product and the extent of distribution, prevention of any further exposure to the contaminated product, and initiation of regulatory action if indicated. An additional critical role of outbreak investigation is to identify contributing factors in order to present, prevent any future outbreaks from a similar problem. In 1998, uh, FDA initiated an effort known as a National Food Safety System Project to improve coordination and communication among public health and food regulatory officials. And enhanced surveillance systems are also important tools for improving the response to outbreaks. For example, PulseNet enables a national network of public health laboratories to fingerprint bacteria that may be implicated. Another system is the Electronic Laboratory Exchange Network, or ELEXNET. It is the nation's first internet-based interagency food testing reporting system developed to provide access to critical food testing data in federal, state, and local food safety laboratories. Our activities uh, with school children and the prevention of disease therein uh, are specifically aimed at reducing uh, specific diseases, namely mainly four different disease categories. Uh, we have uh, been working with USDA on a project to revise the Serving It Safe, a manager's toolkit. We've also been participating with CDC and the National Coalition, Coalition for Food Safe Schools. We thank you for the opportunity to discuss FDA's food safety activities. We look forward to working with both subcommittees on ways to continue to improve the safety of the nation's food supply. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Morano? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittees. I am very pleased to appear before you today to discuss the role of the U.S. Department of Agriculture in ensuring the safety of foods used in the National School Lunch Program. I am Dr. Elsa Morano, USDA Undersecretary for Food Safety. With me today, also on behalf of USDA, are Mr. Eric Bost, Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services, and Mr. Barry Carpenter, Deputy Administrator for Livestock and Seed at the Agriculture, Agri Agricultural Marketing Service. I also am pleased to be here today with Dr. Lester Crawford, uh, from whom you heard just uh, a second ago, my good friend and colleague uh, from FDA. Although Dr. Crawford just recently came on board, we've already had a number of productive meetings on food safety issues of mutual concern, and I look forward to many more. Well, as, as, as it has been said already, the National School Lunch Program plays an important role in ensuring access to safe, nutritious, and healthful diets to our school children. The program operates in more than 97,000 public and private schools and residential child care institutions. It provides nutri nutritionally balanced, low-cost, or free lunches to more than 27 million children each school day. I care deeply about this program, both on a personal and professional level. On a personal level, I have a niece and nephew who live in Miami, Florida. Alina and Peter eat school lunches. And as their aunt, I expect the meals served to them to be safe as well as nutritious. On a professional level, as you know, I am responsible for the safety of meat, poultry, and egg products. I am committed to ensuring these foods are as safe as they can possibly be, not only for my family and school children, but for all Americans. As you can see by the chart before you, and maybe we need to uh, pivot that a little bit, Mr. Chairman, so you can see it a little bit better. Several agencies work together to ensure the success of the National School Lunch Program. Within USDA, the Food and Nutrition Service, FNS, administers the program at the federal level. FNS coordinates with the Agricultural Marketing Service, AMS, and the Farm Service Agency, which purchase commodities and donate them to participating schools. 
It is important to note, however, that donated commodities represent only 17% of the dollar value of food served in school cafeterias. Schools, as it's been stated already, contract independently with food processors and distributors for the remaining food, and these firms must demonstrate that they are capable of complying with all product specifications and contractual requirements of the school. Well, the federal agencies depicted on this chart represent people who are committed to the safety of school lunches. Not only is it important that these agencies work well together, but it's equally important that they work well with the schools and local authorities. In fact, the information exchanged across the dotted line that you see on this chart must be as complete, accurate, and timely as possible in order for the system to be effective. Let me take a moment to give you an overview of how the people depicted on this chart work together to ensure the safety of school lunches. First, and beginning at the top, school food service workers nationwide are trained to provide safe, healthy, and nutritious food to school children by following good hygienic and safe handling practices in preparing meals. Coupled with their efforts, state and local health departments work closely with the schools so they effectively follow safe food handling and preparation procedures such as those of the food code to ensure that safe food preparation indeed takes place. Within the federal government, as shown on the left side of the picture, the Food and Nutrition Service, FNS, works closely with and relies heavily on the authority vested with the Food Safety and Inspection Service, FSIS, to establish, enforce, and monitor meat and poultry safety requirements. FSIS inspects all federally slaughtered and processed meat and poultry, as well as processed egg products. FSIS uses the same inspection standards for meat, poultry, or ed egg products served in the National School Lunch Program as for those consumed by the general public. FSIS also serves as the link or connector to agencies in the Department of Health and Human Services, as shown on the right side of the picture. AMS builds on these food safety protections by requiring their own graders to be present during the production or processing of items to be purchased by USDA to ensure that their specifications are met. So close is our working relationship with AMS that FSIS gives AMS graders at meat and poultry plants the authority to detain product for subsequent review by FSIS. Within the Department of Health and Human Services on the right side of the figure, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in partnership with state and local health departments conducts surveillance through the FoodNet Active Surveillance System for Foodborne Illness that Dr. Crawford just spoke about. In addition, FDA is the entity that is responsible for establishing, monitoring, and enforcing food safety requirements for foods in their jurisdiction. So as you can see, we do have a strong infrastructure, but it is important that along with an infrastructure, procedures exist to make sure that outbreaks are prevented, and if they occur, that they are quickly responded to. The Commodity Holds and Recalls Procedures, CHARP, was introduced in 2001 to achieve just that. It was designed to improve coordination among agencies in order to minimize the impact of outbreaks involving school lunches. As soon as we are alerted to cases of foodborne illness by CDC, state, and or local officials, the suspected product is immediately held at the school. FSIS alerts FNS and AMS, with FNS tracking the product to the schools and AMS tracking it to the manufacturer. The investigation of an outbreak includes FSIS, FDA, as well as CDC and local health authorities. The investigation includes victim interviews, laboratory tests, plant visits, and record reviews. Good epidemiological investigation by state health departments and CDC is crucial, since it provides us with the information needed to determine the foods that may be involved. It is important to again note that with the CHARP system, the food in question is held even during the investigation to ensure that the outbreak does not go further. The food manufacturer is held responsible and through enforcement, corrective actions are taken to ensure the cause of the outbreak is addressed. So in summary, when a food safety concern is raised about a commodity product purchased by USDA for the school lunch program, the product is held, all appropriate agencies are notified, an investigation is initiated and steps are taken to ensure the problem is corrected. USDA recognizes that school food service professionals play a significant role in ensuring food safety and for that reason conducts numerous programs to educate these individuals on proper handling and cooking of USDA regulated products. FSIS has designed educational materials for food service professionals and these materials are shared with FNS who funds their publication and distribution to all schools participating in the National School Lunch Program. 
FNS also provides training and technical assistance to state agencies and local school food authorities that administer the National School Lunch Program. In fact, FNS has received $2 million annually for the past four years to promote food safety. In closing, USDA agencies are working with each other and with their sister agencies at HHS to ensure the safety of food for school children and for the population as a whole. I thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak on this matter, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Let me say at the outset that it, it would be unfair to blame either Dr. Crawford or Dr. Morano for this tangled mess that we have when it comes to food safety in America and inspection. This has been created over a span of 85 years, long before any of us arrived, uh, perhaps with the exception of Senator Thurman, before any of us <laughs> arrived in uh, Washington, D.C. But I will tell you this, that if you're going to come and testify today to defend the system, be prepared for some questions that dispute some of the things that you've said. Because quite honestly, if you look at the chart and you hear the testimony, you have to believe this system is as good as it gets. And then you look at some of the evidence that's come forward. David Jackson in the Chicago Tribune. Let me give you one illustration and ask you to respond. Georgia-based suppliers Zardic Incorporated recalled 556,000 pounds of school lunch hamburger in 1998 because a sample tested positive for listeria. Zardic officials notified hundreds of distributors about the problem, but Zardic had no idea which schools the distributors were serving. Such records are considered confidential. Is that the standard that we want to establish when it comes to tainted hamburger with listeria going into the school lunch program, uh, Dr. Morano? I'd be happy to answer that question. Uh, this is something that's been um, so important in the agency's mind, if I can call it that, as a collective, that um, I'd like to, to tell you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we just published a final rule um, that allows FSIS to release distribution lists belonging to food establishments involved in a recall to state and federal agencies. Uh, this is one of those steps that I believe maybe you mentioned in your opening uh, comments, and I believe this is something that's going to go a long way towards helping track uh, these outbreaks and to helping uh, state and other agencies have the information on the distribution of the food from a manufacturer all the way down to its final destination in order to um, to be able to uh, conduct a recall that is as efficient as possible. So this is in response April 26th of this year to yes, some of these concerns that have been expressed? Uh, well, it's it's one of the things that, that we're doing, and you may have seen the news release that we put out April 26th, as a matter of fact. We're glad exactly you're doing it. This. I'm glad you're doing it. The, mm -hmm. the object here is to protect the kids, and Absolutely. if it's done in a timely fashion, I support it. But now let's talk about burritos for a minute. Nice. And um, that was something also brought out during the course of the uh, uh, Chicago Tribune series. Uh, let me see if I understand what happened here. They started detecting problems with burritos school, uh, served to school children in May, uh, and then over 1,200 children over the course of time uh, became sick until October. During that time, the FDA and the USDA were trying to determine which burrito ingredient was causing the illness. Because, my friends, the nature of the ingredient defines which agency gets worried. So initially, the suspicion was the meat in the burrito. In steps the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Let's go after the meat. They went after the meat for a long period of time and established, nope, that's not the problem. It could be the flour in the burrito in steps the Food and Drug Administration. Now they have to try to get involved in this. Let me ask you just at the outset, Dr. Crawford, can you explain that process to a family with a sick child from a school cafeteria with a straight face? Well, uh, we would, of course, empathize with the, uh, with the parents of the children and do the best we could. The, the issue is what's in there, and I believe in that particular outbreak that the cause of the outbreak was never really determined. The ingredients uh, did seem to be those that were regulated by FDA, and that is obviously something that uh, uh, we, we have authority over and, um, and we need to, to take care of. Is this a radical idea that perhaps if the same agency were looking at all the ingredients at the same time, it might be safer for the school children of America? It's an idea that has been uh, voiced abroad, and I don't think it's a radical idea, no. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Morano, is that a radical idea? 
No, no, absolutely not. But let me let me um, offer a few things about that outbreak, which occurred in 1998, as you said very well. Um, what we public health officials always want to to do is try to find not only number one the vehicle of infection, but the causative agent of the disease, because that way doctors can know how to treat it, and because that way we can find which food item was responsible and recall it from market. Um, as I understand it, in this particular case, CDC, which of course was very much involved uh, at some point, was helping all the other agencies trying to determine what was the cause of the outbreak. It turns out, as Dr. Crawford said, we never found out. I, we suspect it was some chemical agent, but we just have no idea. Battery of tests were done. But the important thing here is, what do you do to try to minimize any more kids from getting sick? You don't just sit around uh, conducting tests and do nothing. Um, this particular case, it took a while for um, FSIS and uh, really the federal government in general to get uh, informed about it because the state and local health agencies were handling the outbreak at first. But suffice it to say that um, we at FSIS um, got this company to recall 1.2 million pounds of burritos. Um, it turns out that what everybody is believing is that perhaps it was the tortillas, and, and that's supported by the fact that I believe one of the schools actually used the tortillas to make their own burritos with their own meat ingredients and um, found that uh, that got people sick as well. Were you um, aware, incidentally, Dr. Morano, yes. that during the course of this that the owner of the company when he wanted to trace where all the burritos had been shipped, was told that he couldn't get the records because the USDA had them and wouldn't give them to the FDA. Th that's what I read, and, and for that reason, when you uh, read this uh, news release that we just put out about the distribution, that's exactly what it's intended to correct, if, if I will. Well, let me ask you about something else. Sure. Do you think that the USDA should require distributors and other suppliers who have contract with schools to provide schools with the identity of the manufacturers, subcontractors, and other suppliers uh, who provide food to the school lunch programs? Well, absolutely, it's it's important for the school lunch uh, program to have such a flow of information that you would people can. That? Absolutely, but the thing that um, I think we have to realize, though, is when when we talk about, um, as I heard um, Congressman Delora and I. Uh, share in her passion for food safety, I might add, uh, when, when we talk about, well, should, should we be supplying um, these schools with information regarding each plant and how they're doing and, and the bad actors and the good actors and so forth, to me, um, it's my responsibility that there be no bad actors. Uh, I, I see it as a shirking of my responsibility to simply say to people, um, I'm going to to give you a list of the bad actors and you, you know, figure it out for yourself who you want to buy from or who you don't want to buy from. It shouldn't be put on the schools to do that. It should so be... So you wouldn't object then to giving the schools, for example, uh, all federal agencies, giving the schools information on the food safety records of suppliers to the school lunch program? Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't think that's the way to go simply because it's shirking my responsibility. I think schools, when they buy uh, food for their programs, if it's federally inspected food, as it's supposed to be, federally inspected meat and poultry, they should have the confidence that we are doing our job at FSIS to make sure that all meat and poultry companies that are in business are producing safe so food. if you inspect a company that is supplying hamburger to the school lunch program and you find that they need to recall a product because it's contaminated, Correct. you're saying that you would never allow them to supply the school lunch program again? What I'm saying to you is that if there's a problem that costs a recall, I'm going to go after that company big time to see what are they doing wrong in the but processing But you're not going line. to eliminate them, are you? If it warrants uh, doing that, it might be uh, what is necessary. What I'm trying to tell you is that I'm not going to allow bad actors to be well, supplying that, that food be, not only to school lunch but to anybody. That's going to be your definition and your call. In some situations, you're going to continue call in some situations you're going to continue to allow them to do business under certain changed inspection standards. I've seen that happen before. My question is, should a school official who runs a school lunch program know that you've made that judgment call? 
that I've made the judgment call of allowing somebody who should not be selling meat and poultry right. to do that? Uh, let me be very clear on the question. Someone has violated some federal food safety standards mm -hmm. to the point where you have gone into their plant and said you have to change this process right. at your plant, or even further, you have to recall your product. Correct. You may or may not at that point decide to disqualify them from the school lunch program. It's possible you may say you can continue in the program. But as a school official, should I know that this has taken place? I guess it's not a bad idea, certainly, for okay. schools to know um, what we've done in terms of uh, plans that have had to, to do recalls because of things that are obviously badly wrong with their systems. Thank you. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if, if, um, if we are to inundate the schools with all kinds of information on uh, a whole variety of different things that, a, that may occur in a plant or may not occur in a plant and put it on their head to figure out what that all means in terms of who they should buy from and sh who they shouldn't buy from. I'm just telling you that I feel personally responsible and our agency needs to be the one to, to make sure that whatever is put out in commerce for school system or not is safe. That's our responsibility. Mr. Dykeman, I'm sorry I didn't have time to ask you questions in this round, but I want to thank the GAO. You did a great job on this report. Congressman Horn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dykeman, I have some questions here on the GAO situation. <laughs> in your testimony today, you re-emphasize that there are endemic problems in the nation's food safety system that lead you to believe we should be considering consolidating federal food safety activities into one agency. What remedy would you specifically request? What remedy? Uh, it, I think what's really needed is an assessment, which to my knowledge has not been done, an assessment of the pros and cons of not only combining inspection services into one agency, but the broader issue of all food safety activities. And there needs to be really, an, and the National Academy of Sciences was going to do this, but I do not believe they have. They were going to look at basically the costs and benefits of combining all agencies into one. But you have to also look at the legislative authorities to come up with a generic food safety legislation. And I, I think that really is probably the first step. Uh, even if you don't combine the agencies, there at least should be legislation that's based on risk. And right now we don't have that. Have you had a chance to look at either the senators or uh, our witness this morning, uh, Rosa L. De Loro? Uh, have you had a chance to look at those bills? To some extent. Uh, we support recall authority. We obviously support a single food safety agency. Uh, I, I don't have the bill in front of me, so I can't comment on individual provisions. I could do that for the record if, if you feel that's warranted. Uh, state and local food safety officials also play a vital role in the food safety web. Do you have any recommendations on improving their performance? Well, w we haven't looked at the state and local performance, but the, in my statement I indicated several actions that we felt, and, and they were discussed to some extent, uh, by by the, the panel uh, previous uh, by by the panel just a few minutes ago, there are several actions that the federal government can do to place better information at the state and local level. One of the things uh, we, we were just talking about recall data, but also how about compliance data, and putting it into a package that is understandable. We spend a billion dollars a year at the federal level. Uh, on food safety, uh, states spend I think about three or four hundred million dollars, and we should have good data systems so that all the actors in the food safety system can use the federal information in an efficient way. I uh, go around the country about terrorism. Now we talk about what happens in a city if there is germ type of situation where it's in a pesticide or whatever, how do we relate to this and what is the responsibility uh, of, say, the State Department of Health, for one thing, besides the federal side? And uh, 
do you find that that is one way to deal with this? Well, the states obviously have first response capability, but if you look at the, uh, the, at the weaknesses in the food safety system, it really doesn't matter if it's deliberate contamination or accidental contamination. Uh, the consequences are, are basically the same. People get sick, people can die. So I, I think the things that we're talking about today and the things that are in the legislation that we mentioned earlier, uh, those are trying to improve uh, the adequacy of our federal food safety system. And I think they will help us, whether it's a deliberate contamination or an accidental contamination. We haven't done any work specifically at GAO at uh, what actions the federal uh, government is doing on deliberate contamination, although we just started an assignment to look at what food processing facilities are doing, how have they geared up since September 11th. And we'll be happy to report that to both committees when we finish that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to have a question or two on Dr. Murano and Dr. Crawford. And based on the testimony from the General Accounting Office, it seems that more effort goes into procuring safe foods purchased by the Department of Agriculture for our school meal programs than foods purchased directly by local governments or schools. Is that uh, a fair statement? Well, I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of meat and poultry. And um, to me, um, everybody deserves safe food. Um, I don't make that distinction in, in my mind because um, the same kids who are eating the school lunch, they're eating at other places, and so are their parents, grandparents, et cetera. Um, having said that, for that very reason, to me, we have to have um, a system that's going to provide as safe of food as possible to everybody. Um, now, let me speak very briefly about, for example, uh, when we talk about ground beef, um, AMS, uh, who procures the food for the school lunch program, um, they have a requirement for an intervention strategy or a decontamination step, if you will, uh, of ground beef processors to try to uh, ensure that that food, that that meat is as safe as possible. Well, last week we announced uh, our own directives, FSIS did, to exactly do that, to say to ground beef establishments, you must have an intervention strategy, and if you don't, you must require it of your suppliers of trimmings, which is where the ground beef comes from. And if you don't, uh, we're going to subject you to uh, increased testing for Salmonella and E. coli 157H7. So it's the way that I, as a microbiologist, know that we can really make a difference is by the action of what happens in a processing plant. The decontamination that you can have on that product is what's really going to make a difference. And so I applaud AMS for having done that for a while. And I'm happy to say that that's what we're heading towards as well in FSIS because I, I truly believe we all have to um, have the same safety in our food supply and nobody deserves any safer food than anybody else and, and I'm committed to that. I believe the Department of Agriculture and Food and Drug Administration have maintained any lists of firms that have negative inspection reports or warning letters. and may be considered to be problem, problem firms that could be made available to federal, state, and local procurement officials. And I'm curious, have any state or local authorities ever expressed an interest in this type of information? Well, let me just quickly answer, and then I'll, mm -hmm. I promise Lester I'll let you. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no um, worry, we questioners I, also. I, it's equal opportunity questioning. I understand that. Um, we publish on the web, um, on the FSI's website, quarterly enforcement reports and our recall information as well. And that's available to everybody, um, school lunch procurers and, and anybody else for that matter. So, so that's information that they have that you know, can give them a, certainly a sense of who the quote unquote bad actors are. Uh, and I think that's important information that they welcome. Now that's the, uh, the information comes from the Food and Nutrition Services. Is that list it's of the school meal supplier? Uh, this 
particular information I just spoke about is our FSIS website. So it's it's not only uh, limited to whoever uh, supplies meals to the school lunch program, but everybody. All meat and poultry plants that have had recalls, uh, that have had enforcement actions, are published in our website. And that would include food and nutrition service. Sure. Yeah. And uh, is that utilized? Do you see what kind of counts go in there? Um, I'm sure if somebody does, I, I, I will get that information for okay. you. If um, you would, sure. with, uh, out of objection, I'd uh, have that in this point in the record. Uh, when it's necessary to stop further use or distribution of contaminated foods, the Department of Agriculture has the authority to stop the distribution, a product, for up to 20 days while they seek a court order to seize any tainted foods. What should be done, in your opinion, to enable local authorities to stop further distribution or use of contaminated food in much of the same manner might go on? Well, certainly having that detention authority is extremely important. Um, we, of course, whenever it's meat or poultry that is involved in any outbreak, whether school-related or not, um, that's one option that we certainly have. We, of course, um, let the company know that they need to issue a recall, and all of them do. Uh, but let me, let me give you an example, Mr. Horn, of, of uh, an instance where we have exercised very recently that authority. Uh, there was some product that came, uh, uh, it was a bologna type product that came from, from Brazil that did not go through our inspection, which uh, was not supposed to happen, certainly. When, as soon as we find out about it, not only did we inform the, the company that they needed to recall the product, but we went and sent all um, our compliance officers to all 30 stores where the product was and physically removed it. Uh, so it's an authority that we avail ourselves of, and I intend to use it as, as much as possible. So I believe that's one way that people can, um, quote unquote, effect as, as efficient and as thorough a recall as possible with our present authorities. Dr. Uh, Crawford, do you have anything to, that you want to add as to how information could be found on this and what is the Food and Drug Administration doing to help that? Yeah, we have, when we take actions against companies that are uh, purveyors of food, uh, we list it in several different ways. One is uh, we have a publication called the FDA Consumer where recalls and prosecutions are summarized. We also have a website where we do uh, essentially the same thing as uh, Dr. Murano said. Um, th there is one other thing uh, in terms of authorities in this direction. And that is, uh, we're aware that um, the so-called bioterrorism bill is currently being conferenced. And the administration um, has asked for uh, several food safety proposals that I believe, if I may, might relate to what we're talking about at this juncture. And among these are registration, record-keeping requirements, administrative detention, debarment, and increased coordination of food safety activities between the executive branch agencies. And we think uh, in this administration, and particularly at the Food and Drug Administration, that we need this in order to accomplish our job and would hope it would survive the conference process. Uh, how easy is it for the average citizen to get the FDI consumer? And uh, I assume it's on a website. Yes, it's, it's on a website. And we also maintain a uh, helpline, uh, 800 number, so that we can direct, uh, as does uh, Dr. Murano, we can direct uh, consumers to how to get on the website. We realize that not everyone is um, website friendly. And uh, the FDA consumer is available to anyone that uh, asks FDA in a number of ways, either by email, telephone, or letter. Do you uh, do it on a quarterly or weekly or what? The, the FDA consumer is published uh, on a quarterly basis. Um, and. Uh, the website is updated on a daily basis. Could you uh, get to the uh, staff and the members of the Senate and the House the last three months? Is what information has a been put absolutely. out there? Absolutely. Be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like that also given to us, is also put in the record so we can see the extent to which this situation uh, can be helped by the agency that you represent. And I yield back uh, my time for uh, the, the good member from uh, 
Illinois and Chicago. And uh, thank you. I'd like to recognize Congresswoman Schakowsky for questions. Thank you. Let me um, understand. The USDA is responsible for school food regardless of whether it's meat or poultry or manufactured and includes tortillas. You're, you're the agency in charge of saying this is suitable to go to schools. The Food and Nutrition Service of USDA is correct. Right. So let me follow through this um, burrito tortilla problem a little bit and, and how this, this works. Um, the FDA was responsible for inspecting the tortilla factory. And in 1996 and 1997, the Illinois Department of Public Health, with whom you had contracted, noted, noted that there were sanitation deficiencies. I'm assuming then that there was some enforcement action, but nonetheless, it was in 1998 when in fact there weren't any inspections until for the first 10 months or whatever, that the school illness took place and there was suspicion that it was the, the, the tortillas. So you, I want you to comment on that, but also the fact then that that plant continued to provide school food. Uh, they, they continued to manufacture it. So I'm trying to understand what the sanctions are and where they would come from under this current scheme of things. If you could either, or, and both of you actually respond to that. Here you go first. Um, with respect to FDA, we are responsible for the, uh, the inspection of the tortilla, tortilla factory. The way we do that is we have commissions, contracts, or confidential agreements with states. Now, Illinois is one of 49 states that we have these arrangements with, so in effect, the FDA delegates to the state the responsibility for that inspection. It is not uh, what could be called super delegation, however. We remain in contact with them, and we also um, analyze how well they're performing these tasks. And um, in the case of the tortillas, as you mentioned, there were inspections, and there also were, uh, following that, um, uh, s some um, stepped-up activity by the state. However, um, as we also mentioned earlier, uh, that particular foodborne disease outbreak that you mentioned could never be traced in terms of what the organism was or where, what the actual cause was. There is certainly scientific evidence that it did not come from the meat and poultry part, or, but from the, uh, the FDA-regulated part. But we were never able to find what it was about that, whether it was a, it was a bacterial organism, a viral organism, or a chemical Let, contaminant. Let's, as, let's assume for a moment that we had determined that it was, this is now hypothetical, mm -hmm. a, tor a tortilla factory. Um, then then what, what would the sanctions, what would be the remedy um, to improve the situation? And, and might we expect that they continue to have a, a contract to provide school food? Or, or uh, is it zero tolerance? Is it three strikes, you're out? Is it you have to meet a certain standard? How do we know that the food then is going to be safe? L let me say what FDA would do had we found a problem, let's say a chemical contamination problem. Then, I, then I'll turn it to Dr. Murano for what USDA would do. Um, we would do what we needed to do in order to protect the public health. Uh, if Illinois found, say, a chemical contamination problem, uh, we would immediately go with the state of Illinois to the plant to see what needed to be done to uh, interdict the contaminated product. Um, uh, usually this is worked out in, in um, direct um, communication with the plant on the site. Uh, sometimes we have to do things like seek a court order. Sometimes we have to uh, detain the product. If we do, we generally use state authority to do that uh, because they would have things like quarantine authority or detention. And, and at authority. some point you say, look, you have failed this inspection, that inspection, now we have a problem. You can no longer provide food to the schools? Well, we, at the federal level, we don't have the debarment uh, capability. That's why I mentioned in this pending legislation uh, there is that, um, that ability. What we could do is, working through the state, accomplish that in a variety of ways, depending on what the state laws are. Do you are. ever do that? Yes, we have done that. Okay. And what about the uh, USDA? Then it goes over to you. Okay. 
Um, well, in this case, as you know, as, as Dr. Crawford just said, uh, we suspect it was the tortillas, but let's say for argument's sake that it was the meat and the burritos. Um, uh, one of the things that we did right away as soon as we uh, got involved in this uh, outbreak was to get the company to recall their product. And as I mentioned a little while ago, they recalled 1.2 million pounds of the burritos. This particular company, um, about three months later, uh, was bought out and they changed their name to a, a different name, let's put it that way. But we keep track of these companies by the establishment number. So it doesn't matter how many times somebody changes their name, we know who they are. Um, that company, after they changed their name, um, a few months later, um, was uh, inspection was suspended. We shut them down, basically, because of some uh, failures that they had and have done that several times since. Uh, they have changed their name again and, and been bought by somebody else and so forth. And, and what I'm trying to illustrate by this example is that what we do when we find uh, a company that is producing product whether it's for school lunch or regular. To me, it's just as serious. Um, it's our responsibility to, um, to have increased scrutiny on that company and to see that uh, what measures, what corrective actions they supposedly took uh, as a result of a, of a recall, that they are being followed. What do you mean you shut them down? Uh, you, if, if you suspend uh, inspection, if you say that we're not going to be there to inspect anymore, they cannot uh, operate because but they don't have inspectors. But if it were the meat, if it were the tortillas, but you're in charge of the school lunch program, could you shut them down, the tortillas? Um, People? The tortilla factory, remember, is the, is the one that supplied, it, supplied the tortillas to this particular company. Is, if this particular company is operating um, following all the required procedures and, and food safety programs that they have. In, in other words, they're not doing anything wrong themselves. They're just requiring or, or acquiring a product uh, from their suppliers that's not safe. That's something that they have to uh, make account of in their HACCP system, if you will, who their suppliers are and what's happening with the product, with the hazards that might be introduced. Uh, so they have some responsibility in that they have to find out uh, what is going on with their suppliers? Of course, we cannot shut down their suppliers because it is a tortilla factory and we don't have jurisdiction over those. Let me say that Mr. Uh, I don't know if it's Bode or Bodie in the next panel is going to be s arguing strongly against creating a single food safety agency. It seems to me from this kind of description of who has power over who and who can in fact intervene at the appropriate time to stop unsafe food, that what we this example really underscores the, the need. And, and maybe Mr. Dickman might, Dykeman might want to, ref, you know, because you're, you're, uh, you spoke out in favor of a single food agency. We're going to hear later testimony that this is a bad idea. And I wondered if I you mean, wanted to comment on that. I mean, the basic question, and not meaning any disrespect to the witnesses, uh, but the basic question really that you should be asking is, why do you have to have two agencies to try to answer this question? Why can't you look to one official to give you a straightforward answer? Uh, but this is the issue of recalls, the issue of detaining authority, the issue of equivalency on imports. I mean, there is a list that goes on and on in terms of the differences in authorities. It's not the agency's fault. That's the way Congress set it up. And obviously, if the industry is begging not to do something, you have to look pretty leery at why they don't want a change. Is it because they feel that there'll be more uh, vigilant enforcement or vigilant uh, regulations? So for a variety of reasons, I agree with you. In, in my testimony, I think it, it's been alluded to this issue of information to school districts right now that might be something that could be a useful tool. The, the, what, I, what I was had in mind was this notion of a, a single comprehensive database that, uh, that right now had information from USDA, from the FDA. And, and rather than saying, I, let's not overload these school districts, the city of Chicago, there are, what, 400,000 children, some, some huge number of kids. So we are concerned, and I think someone is diligent enough to be willing to look at these databases. Yes, 
want to have confidence in you but also have a responsibility can't we get that information out now on a database useful to people in those positions of authority well let me um answer begin the answer to that question by um saying one of the things that that we're trying to do um is work very, very closely with FDA as much as possible. Uh, because clearly, the reason why people keep thinking about a single food safety agency is because they see uh, that in the past, certainly there's been a, a, an, a lack of coordination. Uh, sure. That's right. certainly what's been uh, mentioned here. And it's and inevitable, in my view, if there are multiple agencies. So, so but, but let me uh, say something uh, that might be relevant here, and that is in 1999, FSIS signed a memorandum of understanding with FDA. And what that did is it um, helped get our relationship closer so that we would, FSIS, since we are in meat and poultry plants every day, if we are in plants that are dual jurisdiction, for example, let's say the a company that makes pizza, that's pepperoni pizza on one line, and the other line is cheese pizza. We're there every day, FDA is not because of their um, regulations. It, it enables us to be able to, if we see something that's not quite uh, right that FDA needs to know about, because we're there every day, we call FDA and we basically have a partnership going. Um, that's really paid off in spades um, very recently. Uh, in fact, April 24th, there was a, another uh, press release that was put out that talked about a company uh, in Chicago, a food distribution firm, and I think Senator Durbin probably knows about this, this particular situation, but uh, a legal action resulted. Uh, it was really the first joint prosecution between FSIS and FDA under our MOU where uh, this particular company um, suffered really, um, well, was sentenced on, on two misdemeanors, uh, felony count for selling adulterated poultry. It's the first time ever that this has happened where the two agencies have collaborated uh, to prosecute you know, a company that really n did not need to be in business and uh, were successful at doing that. So that's an I, I, example of what we can do. Well, it, to me it's an example of, it speaks to the need for a single agency. So it's not just that, isn't that great, we happen to be in the same plant, but thank you very much. I, I might uh, just add as well that uh, it almost sounds like the Middle East peace negotiations. Now we have the FDA and the USDA speaking to one another. I mean, this is a breakthrough, and I hope it leads to lasting peace and food safety. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Congresswoman Maloney from New York. Thank you for joining us. And I, I thank uh, Chairman uh, Durbin and, and uh, Ranking Member uh, Schakowsky, uh, along with Chairman uh, Horn, for, for having this. It's a tremendously important uh, issue, and it sounds like you're, you're making progress towards uh, one, one agency that's more accountable. I, I represent New York, and I'm certainly keenly aware of the problems that have existed, and, and food safety is tremendously important. We have a school system that feeds over 1.1 million students in 1,200 public schools. Uh, since we have the USDA here, I, I wanted to ask a, a question that uh, really concerns New York. And I would like to, to ask the Agriculture Department's assistance on a very troubling issue in, in New York now. Due to the terrorist attacks on, on September 11th, the public schools in the city, many of them, particularly in, in the area, were closed uh, for a number of days, uh, some for months. Because of this, the New York City Boards of, uh, Board of Education experienced uh, significant revenue losses because of lost lunch sales. And under the school or under the federal school lunch program, school districts are paid based upon the lunches that are served. And because of this closure, the board still must pay fixed cost such as salaries for the lunchroom monitors and cafeteria workers. And uh, I am being told that the Board of Ed will not be reimbursed uh, for these losses uh, that uh, total roughly $3 million. Uh, the city is uh, uh, suffering tremendously. We have over a $4 billion uh, deficit uh, breach uh, in our budget, budget gap. So I would like to really request that USDA uh, assist the city in following up with the Emergency Management Agency regarding this issue either uh, waive the, the loss of the funds due to September 11th or work with FEMA, who is denying reimbursing them for the loss. And I, I would like to see if Mr. Crawford could be helpful with this. 
Ten years ago, I could have, but I've moved over to FDA, so. Yeah. Could, could you? Um, I'm, I'm told by my colleagues at FNS Food Nutrition Service, and that's really the, um, they would be the appropriate uh, folks to, to help out in this regard, and uh, they will get back to you very, very quickly uh, with what you need. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I uh, feel that the issue we're looking at is more than consolidating, uh, but really having the information so that people who are selling faulty food are, are that you not only get the information, they should be barred from selling food to our school children. And I'd like to, to know uh, your response to that. In the city of New York, if you are a contractor who does faulty work, you are barred from doing future contracts in the city. There's a federal statute that says that uh, certain contractors who have mismanaged projects or whatever, they're far barred from getting federal contracts. Well, certainly supplying food to children is critically important. I'd say more important than, than uh, repairing our roads. Why don't we have a, a, a standard that you're barred from uh, selling food if you, if you have, have a history or you have bought faulty projects, now, faulty food? You say, well, this, this particular business bought uh, food that was bad. Well, isn't it somebody? The, somebody's got to be responsible. They maybe require them to taste it and eat it before they put it into our school system. But I mean, someone's got to be held accountable to say it's not their fault because they bought it from someone else. I, I find an inexcusable federal standard. I think we, someone has got to be held responsible, and uh, companies that sell faulty food should be barred from uh, selling food to the to the United States to the, uh, school children, and, and that it should go on their record on the internet so that if anybody else wants to buy from them, they know that their food kills. I mean, so what's your response to that? Um, you go first. I was going to, going to mention that uh, uh, the Bioterrorism Preparedness Act and the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Response Act currently being considered would give us, FDA, the right to debar. We do not have that authority now. Um, and so we, again, encourage uh, the Congress to look carefully at that, and that is the administration position. Mm -hmm. I'll, Thank I'd just you. like to add that I, I truly believe um, that you are absolutely right. In fact, people who, who produce faulty, quote unquote, unsafe food don't need to be selling it to anybody, to anybody. And that is the point that I've tried to make here this afternoon. It's not just a school lunch to anybody. And that is our responsibility as the federal uh, inspection uh, agency that inspects meat and poultry is to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that is our responsibility and holding them accountable through uh, our enforcement actions is exactly what we do on a daily basis. Well, we appreciate your efforts. You've saved millions of lives, but we need to get uh, better at it. And, and I certainly would support a authority to debar. I think that's very important to have enforcement. And I thank the chairman for holding this timely and important uh, hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Maloney. And Dr. Morano, you have said several times today it's going to be zero tolerance in terms of the school lunch program. If they're selling contaminated food, they're going to be disqualified. And that's a matter of record now. So this will be the standard that we're going to hold you to. I, I think you're going to find this a difficult standard uh, to deal with in light of the history of this program and your agency. Let me also add for the record, and it, it's been brought out repeatedly, but just so we understand the size of the armies that we have represented here, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has 7,600 employees involved in inspecting 6,500 facilities more than one inspector for each facility. The Food and Drug Administration has 770 inspectors for 60,000 facilities. That's one for every 80 facilities. So when we start talking about these burritos and how many people are going to look at them, at what stage in the process, you have 80 soldiers at the USDA for every one that they have at the FDA, which doesn't make any sense at all if you both have the responsibility of protecting our school children as you want to. I think that uh, Congressman Horn had a suggestion about uh, your schedules, so maybe you'd like to say something. Uh, we would like to get the next panel to come up, and uh, we would like you to wait uh, and get some dialogue here, because uh, I've found time and time again, and that's the way I do it in the House side, is that uh, the uh, people that have responsibility 
uh, are not in the room when the victims, uh, and uh, we'd like you to react to that. So uh, we've got uh, three seats here, and the clerk will get two chairs, and uh, we'll get everybody around the same table. You want to call this yeah. And so we'll call up the uh, panel two, which is uh, Carolyn Smith DeWall, Sue Donoff, John Bodie, Cheryl Roberts, Mary Klatko. Get them. And anybody be either with the uh, non government as well as government who are going to ask to answer questions, uh, please affirm or not. And uh, affirm means you will be able to uh, give us the information we seek. Mm -hmm. Want to get into this too? Mm -hmm. We have a different set there. Mm -hmm. yeah. If panel uh, two will stand, raise your right hand, and any people assisting you, the clerk will take their names down, too, for the hearing record. And the question is, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before these subcommittees will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that those people affirmed that oath. We thank you very much for coming, and uh, we can begin uh, with Carolyn Smith DeWall, the Director, Program on Food Safety for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. You might tell us a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Chairman Horn, and also thanks to Chairman Durbin and to Representative Sikowski for your uh, attention and your questions today. I'm Caroline Smith DeWall. I direct the Food Safety Program for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. CSPI advocates for food safety and nutrition improvements on behalf of our 800,000 subscribers to Nutrition Action Health Letter. Last December, the Chicago Tribune ran a series of investigative reports that exposed huge gaps in food safety protections in the National School Breakfast and Lunch Program. Contaminated food is particularly dangerous to school children because this population is among those at risk of contracting a serious foodborne disease. Frequently, it can result in hospitalization or even death. Because children are especially vulnerable, many food safety messages are targeted at parents. But when parents send their children off to school, they rely on the school system and the government to ensure the safety of the food their children eat. Unfortunately, as we've seen today, and, and as the Chicago Tri Tribune exposed, their trust is misplaced. I'm gonna talk about three gaps in the system. One is in the area of outbreak recognition, second is in the area of outbreak response, and the third is in the area of outbreak prevention. Several years ago, CSBI be began tracking food poisoning outbreaks uh, to identify food and pathogen combinations. And uh, our list contains uh, many school-based outbreaks. Uh, for example, our list contains outbreaks that have involved over 19 different pathogens or toxins, including some very serious ones like E. coli 015787. And some of the outbreaks the SBI has identified are quite large. One uh, in, in Arkansas, um, over 200 grade school children became sick from a turkey dressing served as part of one of the pre-Thanksgiving meals. People like to have at their schools. And this outbreak was never reported to the CDC because of gaps in our outbreak reporting system. Because the food, now I'm gonna shift over to the response issues. Because the Food and Drug Administration and the US Department of Agriculture lack mandatory recall authority, once a harmful food is identified, the federal government must rely on the plant itself, or in some cases, local state governments, to initiate a recall. In the burrito outbreak, which we've talked about earlier today that affected 1,200 school children, the plant manager 
who was trying to direct the recall, found that he couldn't obtain his own shipping records from, to give them to FDA because they had previously been given to USDA. According to the Tribune report, the manager asked the age-old question that applies not only here but in many different instances when it comes to food safety, who's in charge when it comes to the federal food safety regulation? Sometimes the federal government isn't involved in managing and controlling a school food poisoning outbreak. Instead, consumers must rely on the effectiveness of state, county, and local governments. But two recent surveys have found that state and local governments who inspect restaurants and other food service, including nursing homes, schools, daycare centers, and others, these, these inspection systems frequently run at the local level, are chronically underfunded, poorly staffed, and often they're not enforcing food safety standards that comply with national recommendations. Finally, I'm going to get to the issue of preventing food poisoning outbreaks in the schools. Preventing these outbreaks is largely dependent on the two government agencies we've heard from today, USDA and FDA. But because FDA's food plant inspection rate is so low, and GAO uh, recently estimated it to be once every five years FDA actually gets to visit a plant, if this system is not adequate to protect the safety of the food going into the school lunch program. The desire to minimize costs with food purchased by the school lunch program means that in some at some places, the program may actually purchase low quality food. And in one shocking example of this, USDA unsuccessfully tried to shut down a major supplier to the school lunch program for, school, for food safety violations. During that, same, um, during that same year, the company called Supreme Beef sold $23 million of beef to the government for the 1999-2000 school year. This is the same year that USDA was trying to close the company down. This represented over 15% of the total beef purchased by the program that year. In 2000, USDA responded to this unacceptable situation by tightening its requirements for ground meat purchases and rejecting ground meat that tests positive for salmonella and E. coli 015787. And two years later, this has been a successful program because USDA does today have a ready supply of affordable beef for school lunch meals, and our children are getting better and safer products. We have five recommendations we'd like the committee to consider. First, the federal food safety agencies need mandatory traceback and recall authority. Second, Congress really needs to give FDA more resources to inspect the 60,000 domestic food plants under its jurisdiction. Third, USDA should require processors of ground meat that want to sell to the school lunch program to test their meat much more frequently. And in addition, they should increase the government testing frequency. Right now, they're just testing meat going to the school lunch program once a day, and that's not enough. And in addition, USDA should continue to reject positive lots. Fourth, we believe that USDA and the state should audit, uh, should conduct audits to ensure that food plants and schools are being inspected regularly. And where local programs are weak, states should maintain a separate inspection force that goes into schools, daycare centers, nursing homes, hospitals, and prisons. And finally, we urge Congress to pass the Durbin Deloro Safe Food Act. This bill offers a much needed strategy to consolidate food safety regulatory functions into a single food safety agency. Thank you very much. We thank you very much and uh, those 800,000 uh, consumers that are helping to fund you uh, doing the right thing. Now we have a witness that I know has to need for other areas, and Sue Donath, I know you have to get a cha train, uh, so we'll certainly want to hear your uh, bit, and uh, go ahead.
Thank you. Uh, before I begin my testimony, I'd like to thank Senator Durbin for inviting me to participate in this hearing today. My name is Su Susan Donis, and I'm the mother of a child who became extremely ill with hepatitis A after eating frozen strawberries served in her school lunch. My daughter, Lindsay, innocently consumed a strawberry dessert at school, and 28 days later, she became extremely ill. I'm a member of STOP, Safe Tables Are a Priority, and I'm submitting this testimony in order to share with you the devastating effects of foodborne illness. When Lindsay first began exhibiting symptoms, she complained of severe body aches, headache, and abdominal pain. She had a high fever and began vomiting. Assuming that Lindsay had the flu, I kept her home from school. After four days, it became apparent that something was seriously wrong. Lindsay was no longer able to eat or drink, and she would sob because her abdominal pain was so severe. Alarmed, we took Lindsay to the emergency room. She was severely dehydrated, and her urine was the color of weak coffee. The physician immediately suspected hepatitis and admitted Lindsay to the hospital. Lindsay was so dehydrated that the medical personnel had difficulty finding a vein to start an IV. I had to leave the room as my husband and the nurses held my screaming child down in order to get a needle in her arm. Lindsay would remain in the hospital for six days. During that time, my husband and I would sit by her bed and pray that she would stop vomiting. I have never seen a child so sick, and I cannot describe to you what it is like to witness a child so ill, especially when that child is your own. At one point, Lindsay stopped communicating with us and would barely open her eyes. We watched helplessly as she groaned in her sleep while tears silently rolled down, rolled down her cheeks. She was only able to whisper, Mommy, it hurts everywhere. Lindsay had not eaten or had anything to drink in over a week, yet she continued to dry heave, trying to expel the poison in her body. She was on continuous IV fluid, pain medication, and anti-nausea drugs. During her hospitalization, she lost 10% of her body weight, for months after she left the hospital, she battled hair loss, fatigue, and suffered from excruciating shingles twice. She continued to complain of unexplained back pain, and we returned often to the doctor. In the weeks following Lindsay's illness, hundreds of Michigan school children became ill with hepatitis A, most of them in the town where I live. Contaminated frozen strawberries had somehow slipped through the supposed food safety net and been widely distributed in the school lunch program. As a consumer, I was baffled as to how this could happen. As a mother, I was outraged. I began asking questions and demanding answers that no one could give me. Nobody could explain to me how such a thing happened. I learned that there are so many different agencies involved in overseeing the safety of our food supply, there are gaping holes that exist in the present system. I also learned that even though school lunches are served to children who are the most vulnerable population in terms of foodborne illness, there is little in place ensuring their safety. Companies supplying food to be served in school lunches should have to meet a higher standard of safety, not a lower one. More importantly, there must be traceback capability and accountability when a foodborne outbreak occurs. We must be able to pinpoint exactly where the food came from and make sure that it is not further distributed. In addition, if a company has had critical violations in the past or has distributed something that is contaminated, they should be forever barred from doing further business with the federal school lunch program. There are a few important points that I would like to make. First, foodborne illness victims continue to be ignored as real victims. Often the source of their foodborne illness is never discovered because it is often impossible to trace back the contaminated product to its source. We should have the ability to track our food from the farm to the fork. Only then will there be adequate accountability which will help improve the safety of the food we are consuming. Second, there should be a single food safety agency charged with overseeing the safety of the food supply. The fragmented system currently in place is clearly not working. Currently, there are more than a dozen agencies involved in overseeing the safety of the food supply. This severely complicates matters when the source of a foodborne illness falls into multiple jurisdictions. In the case of the contaminated frozen strawberries that caused the hepatitis A epidemic, FDA oversees fruit, but the USDA has jurisdiction for the federal school lunch program. Ultimately, nobody is willing to take responsibility, and it leaves room for blame shifting and a whole lot of red tape. Third, I would like to address public education. Although public education about foodborne illness and its prevention is extremely important, I believe too much emphasis is placed on this by industry and often government. As a consumer, I am not responsible for cleaning up dirty food or cooking cow feces out of my hamburger meat. The food that my family consumes should not be contaminated to begin with. After my daughter Lindsay became ill, I became very educated about foodborne illness. I did everything possible to protect my family, and still we were not protected. 
Tragically, 18 months after Lindsay was stricken with hepatitis A, my oldest daughter, Sarah, then 14 years old, was poisoned with E. coli 157H7. She spent over two weeks in a hospital and went into the life-threatening complication, hemolytic uremic syndrome. She went into kidney failure. She was rushed by ambulance to a children's hospital in another city. There, she endured blood transfusions, endless pain and vomiting, bloody diarrhea, and her pancreas was severely compromised. Again, I had to watch as another child of mine was held down by hospital personnel while needles, tubes, and various equipment were attached to her. The team of pediatric nephrologists treating Sarah were trying to prepare my husband and I for the possibility that our child might die because she was so ill. I remember sitting in the hospital in denial, still not believing that such a thing could be happening to my family a second time. I had done everything right. I had educated myself about foodborne illness. I had become politically involved in the issue, and I had done everything in my power to protect my children. Clearly, it wasn't enough, and it did nothing to protect us from becoming victims again. Sarah now has permanent kidney damage, high blood pressure, and continues to see a pediatric nephrologist on a regular basis. I thank God every day that my daughter is still with us and didn't lose her life like many victims have. We were never able to trace the source of Sarah's illness because hundreds of people had not become ill. It was never investigated thoroughly by the local health department. Sarah could have gotten sick from something I cooked, from something she ate in a restaurant, or she could have been poisoned by something served in her school lunch. We will probably never know, and that is a difficult thing to live with. Incredibly, she was not important enough to even warrant an investigation. As a mother, I refuse to sit back while industry points their fingers at consumer education and somehow insinuates that I am to blame for my children getting sick, or it wasn't prevented because of something I didn't do. My children and I did nothing wrong, and we are not to blame. As a citizen, I expect public health and safety to be the paramount concern of lawmakers. The Lindsay and Sarah Donis of this world are not expendable in the pursuit of cheaper, less burdensome regulations. Furthermore, when the government is entering into contracts with food suppliers, the contracts should not go to the lowest bidder if they are not also the safest bidder. As citizens, we should insist on maintaining zero tolerance for E. coli and salmonella in school lunch meat. Foodborne illness victims should be given the opportunity to tell their stories in forums such as this hearing today. It seems that participating in government as a citizen is almost impossible if one works full time and lives outside the Beltway. Most foodborne illness victims and their families are average people like myself and not politicians, but nobody understands this issue better than someone who has experienced it. I hope that when you're reading your statistics and making your decisions, you will remember these statistics are not just numbers. They represent real people, many who were not as lucky as my daughters and paid for their trust in the current food safety system with their lives. In closing, I guess I would just like to emphasize that the fact that I had two children get sick within a two-year span of time after being educated, after being involved, and after doing everything I was supposed to do, the, the system in place for ensuring food safety failed miserably, failed my family, failed my children, and it needs to be corrected. Thank you. Well, we thank you for this uh, heart-rending story, and thank you for coming. I know you have to get that train, so thank you. we're conscious of that. Our next uh, witness is uh, John Bode, uh, counsel for the National Food Processors Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Bode counsel for the National Food Processors Association. NFPA appreciates the opportunity to present testimony uh, to this hearing. Uh, NFPA, Food Processors, uh, is the largest food-only trade association in the United States, representing the $500 billion U.S. food processing industry on scientific and public policy issues involving food safety. Known as the Food Safety People, and FPA has three laboratories in the United States, and its members are strong supporters of the organization precisely because of its assistance to the industry on food safety matters and uh, providing scientific and technical services to the industry in support of food safety. 
Uh, because I understand my testimony as submitted will be uh, placed in the record, I'd like to take the opportunity to use uh, my time to address several of the points that have previously been been raised. I think that might advance the discussion best. By the way, every one of your written statements automatically go in when we call up you as a witness. Thank you. Uh, regarding uh, recall authority, mandatory recall authority. The National Food Processors Association respectfully uh, uh, disagrees. We do not support mandatory recall authority. Uh, the reason for that is we feel that it is not only unnecessary because the uh, industry cooperation response uh, to federal requests for recall uh, has been uh, very strong. There is a great record of, of uh, industry cooperation uh, with recall requests, and recalls have been highly effective. Uh, but also because it can actually undermine the effectiveness, effectiveness of our current voluntary system. Uh, now, if a system is mandatory, of course, due process concerns uh, are addressed. And uh, the other issue that has to be addressed then is if, if the government requires a recall is uh, who bears responsibility if the recall is inappropriate. Certainly there are a number of times where recalls are undertaken when it turns out there, it, it was not warranted uh, by threat to food safety. What's most important and we have pressed for is strong coordination on recall. Any time uh, both FDA and, and USDA require that when industry undertakes a recall, there be a recall coordinator, a focal point of control on the industry side. We feel it's important that that occur on the government side as well, so that a recall can be effectively accomplished by the, recall, the, the industry recall coordinator having one government person to deal with on uh, the, the recall side. That's not been a problem uh, between USDA and FDA, but it can be dealing with the federal level, especially FDA and then uh, states and localities uh, with their regulatory officials um, uh, involved. I've never heard reference to country of origin labeling as a service to recalls and would respectfully submit uh, that that does not make sense. It is distribution records and um, uh, that are effective in dealing with recalls. Uh, I'd note that killer foods are against the law. It is simply against the law to sell uh, foods that are uh, going to make people sick. Uh, a violation of, um, of procurement uh, requirements uh, for the school lunch program uh, is, is uh, certainly something that can be basis for debarment under school lunch authorities today. So that authority exists now and there have been debarments uh, exercised by the Food and Nutrition Service uh, for violations and I believe concerning some where uh, adulterants were at issue. Uh, regarding recall announcements, uh, it is very important that recalls be effective. That is what industry works for so fiercely that when a recall is undertaken that we actually get the word out effectively and get that food back. That's of paramount concern. We have had, un unfortunately, um, in, in uh, a number of experiences with recalls, and in one of them uh, there was a unique circumstance, and CDC was able to collect data from the very people who purchased the food, found out that a surprising number of them, I believe it was over a quarter, not only got the word of the recall, understood the recall notice, understood that it related to the food in their, um, in their freezer, but they went ahead and ate it anyway. So it is getting response from, and I, I, I refer you to CDC on, on, on that information. Um, it is getting response from the public when a recall is undertaken. We've got to get the word out and we've got to get response so we get the food back. And saturating uh, the public or schools with information beyond what information they need to act on can have the effect of dulling response uh, and uh, undermining the effectiveness of response to a recall. 
The supreme beef situation was mentioned. Uh, I would simply note that in um, supreme beef, the Department of Agriculture did uh, appeal until I, I gather the Department of Justice indicated appeal was pointless because the courts consistently ruled that the salmonella performance standards simply do not measure food safety. If they measured food safety, that standard would have been upheld and uh, Supreme Beef uh, would, would have been uh, stopped at once. As it is, Supreme Beef was bankrupted uh, even though they prevailed at every, every point uh, of appeal. Um, finally, I will note uh, that um, regarding a single food agency, it was suggested that um, uh, the written testimony I provided was uh, adamantly opposed to a uh, single food agency. Uh, Senator Durbin, we, we do not regard single food agency as a radical idea, uh, but we do respectfully submit that a single food agency is, uh, is simply not likely to provide the sort of benefits that have been suggested. The fundamental differences that exist between the agencies are because of differences in the underlying statutes, and some of the other witnesses have suggested that as well. And so simply merging the agencies won't change those differences in regulatory systems uh, or even the cultures of the agencies. I think you would have a two-branched uh, food safety system that works very much the same way as the current two agencies do separately. And I, I would note that I've had some involvement with federal reorganizations, and uh, there is a very significant loss in productivity of agency personnel when an agency reorganization occurs. I will uh, stop there because I take it I've gone over my time. I appreciate your consideration of our views. Uh, the National Food Processors Association is very dedicated to science-based efforts to advance food safety, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with the committees. Thank you very much. Our next witness uh, will bring some tears, and that's Cheryl Roberts, Comer, Georgia. She, too, is a member of STOP, Safe Tables, Our Priority. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. This is my son, Tyler, and he is the victim of a foodborne illness. On behalf of my family... Excuse me, we're going to have to move that microphone. The clerk will note uh, in order to be heard. <laughs> This is my son, Tyler. He is the victim of a foodborne illness. On behalf of my family, Safe Tables are a priority, and all the victims of foodborne illnesses, thank you for having me today. When Tyler was 11, on, in April of 1998, he's 15 now, Tyler ate just a few bites of a contaminated, undercooked hamburger at school. He realized that it was raw inside and stopped eating it, but not soon enough. It takes only three to five E. coli 0157H7 bacteria to kill a child. Tyler had eaten enough that his next few weeks and hours would be, filled of, would be filled with horror that he would die. Within the next few days, they became, he became very ill. Um, he had diarrhea, pain, vomiting. It, it came and went for days. We visited the doctor who was concerned but not yet connecting his symptoms with hemolytic uremic syndrome. That is an outcome of E. coli 0157H7 poisoning. Since there had been no other reported cases of this in our area. For the next week, Tyler's condition was up and down. At times, he was doubled over with severe stomach cramps. We felt helpless because there was nothing we could do and he was in so much pain. As, the, as his condition got worse, the doctor sent us for more extensive blood work. We were horrified to find out that Tyler had kidney failure. He was hospitalized in Atlanta, 80 miles from our home. We were told that in most cases, children with Tyler's kidney function would be on dialysis, but due to his existing diabetes and age near puberty, we were told that if he went on dialysis, he would probably have to be put on a transplant list. Tyler had to have diuretics, blood transfusion, his color was the color of a sheet, he had severe fatigue, he cried and had horrible nightmares of monsters coming to take him away. He was in the hospital for approximately a week, and it would be well over a year before Tyler had his color and strength back to begin to act and look like a normal child again. And all of this because he ate an undercooked, contaminated hamburger served 
at his school for lunch. We had told the doctor at the excuse me. We had told the doctor at the hospital about the hamburger. It was reported and someone went to the school the next day and took the leftover hamburgers. They went to two different laboratories and tested positive for E. coli 0157H7 bacteria. It was sheer luck that they obtained an identified, identified pathogen and source of where his illness came from. Many times there's no food left over to be tested or the time window has passed or the lab makes an error. In this case, it was clear that there was E. coli 0157H7 in the meat the toddler had been served at school, which should have sparked a community-wide effort to make sure that other children who had eaten the same meat were identified and followed up with and received the necessary, the necessary medical care. Instead, local health officials and the media tried to make it appear that toddler got sick because he was diabetic. Local health officials didn't want anyone to know the meat was contaminated. They didn't even tell us. The health department reacted as though it was our fault that he was sick, and it couldn't be a problem with the school lunch. It was as if they didn't want sure. to believe it could happen in our community. The principal and the superintendent were the ones who notified us. Other parents were sick children, and there were many who called us afterwards and told us their children had the same symptoms, were encouraged to believe that their children had a virus. This endangered other children in our community because E. coli 0157H7 is easily passed between children playing and in daycares and after school, after school facilities in swimming pools. The E. coli outbreak in Atlanta, in Atlanta Water Park that sickened two dozen children and killed one child a few years back was almost certainly of foodborne origin. Another stock member who couldn't be here today has a six-year-old daughter who suffered neurological damage and will endure years of kidney transplants due to E. coli 0157H7 that she contracted from playing with other children who picked up the germ from their school lunch tacos. We shouldn't be putting our children in danger from a simple fact of eating a government-approved lunch. Our story, more than anything, demonstrates how crucial it is to ensure that food safe from pathogens is being sent to school systems, where contaminated food can be mishandled by a distracted worker or cross-contaminated and have a disastrous effect on the health of a captive population of children. Tyler was very sick because his hamburger was, first of all, contaminated and, second, incorrectly prepared. His aging, weakened immune system put him at an especially vulnerable condition for severe food poisoning. We feel very blessed because victims with even fewer health problems have died from this brutal illness. Our story also highlights the fact that victims are all too often treated like second-class citizens by health officials and other workers main, whose main interest is covering up for misdeeds and not protecting the public health. This attitude comes at the expense of the community. We live in a very small town. The impact on our community from this has been huge and divisive. Those who had children who had symptoms were concerned and on one side, while those who don't or didn't and who knew little about the bacteria were on the other, feeling that this couldn't be happening in our small community. No, so no lawsuits were filed against the school, but people still acted as if we were out to hurt the school. This is not an attack on schools. It is a cry for help. The subject of this hearing is to determine what steps our government should be taking to prevent foodborne diseases in the school. And we have outlined some recommendations in our written testimony. But really the answer is simple, as Tyler can tell you and all the other children who have been poisoned by this disease in their government-sponsored lunch lunches. The answer is very simple. Every step you can take will help. Thank you. Well, thank you both. I see your families here, and uh, I hope things are working out fine. I might add on that just now to get it on the record. In terms of uh, hamburger, let's say, what's the uh, Fahrenheit that that ought to be done on, uh, and would that solve a lot of this if it's properly heated? Uh, yes, sir, 160 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature. Um, I, I certainly don't want to take up the time uh, of, of the next witness, but I, I do want to say that um, Ms. Roberts is the reason I came to Washington. You know, I, I had a good career at Texas A&M University, and, and as I like to tell people, I didn't come here because I like to ride the metro. Um, I came here because I believe in making uh, food as safe as possible. Uh, and it, her story, I believe, uh, underscores, if anything, the fact that zero tolerance, which is what we have with E. coli 157H7 in ground beef, does not equal zero risk because we, you can say you have zero tolerance, you can test,
but you can't test the problem away. What, what makes the difference is controlling hazards, is having the establishments de have a decontamination step or require their trimming suppliers to have one. It's the only way that we're actually going to make progress and it's why we put out these directives last week because uh, testing does not um, solve the problem. Chasing after zero um, is not going to guarantee safety and um, what we're going to try to do and we're trying to do is, is make sure that we do the things that are going to work. Thank you. Well, do most uh, people that uh, have small restaurants and big restaurants, how do they do that? Just simply with the thermometer? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, and are there inspections on that? Um, the uh, local health departments, of course, have the uh, are the ones that go into restaurants and make sure that practices, safe food handling and food preparation practices are being followed. Um, but certainly, the again, the, the, the thought that um, uh, having a, a, a testing program that's going to uh, give us uh, what we are after, which is safe food, is, is something that, if anything, can give us a false sense of security. Uh, we know from our own data, for example, that uh, last year uh, all the ground beef establishments that had to recall product because it had E. coli 157H7 had passed their salmonella performance standards. Uh, so testing, again, as a microbiologist, I can tell you this is why uh, HACCP was developed. Uh, because what we want to do is prevent and not be chasing after these bugs. We want to get rid of them, and that's what the directives that I mentioned a while ago uh, are aimed to do. Thank you. When I order a hamburger, I look at it, and if there's one bit of red meat still around there that isn't browned, I don't eat it. And I tell them how I want it to start with. Does that help? Absolutely, it does. Um, because. We certainly know that if you thoroughly cook uh, the meat, you will kill these pathogens. Um, but the important thing is to remember that um, along the food chain, you know, everybody has a role to play. Uh, processors do, as I just mentioned. Uh, certainly the food preparer does and the food handler does. Um, we all have to work uh, towards the same goal. And um, the part of the, the link of the chain, so to speak, that uh, is under my uh, oversight is where we're going to try to make as much of an impact as possible. And, and we appreciate the efforts that um, others have in terms of uh, not only helping us do our job, but also um, in educating the public and consumers regarding exactly the questions that you're just asking. What should be the correct internal cooking temperature and so forth? Yeah, Dr. Crawford, on behalf of uh, uh, FDA, uh, is there anything else we can do other than what uh, Dr. Murano? No, I think Dr. Murano uh, summarized it uh, very well. The E. coli 15787 is uh, something that hasn't always been in our food supply. We hear people say all the time, uh, I've eaten raw hamburgers all my life and I've never gotten ill and I'm going to keep doing it. And what they don't know and don't bother to find out is, is that many of these things are new and emerging and they make foods that were otherwise completely or not nearly completely safe years ago unsafe like uh, raw oysters for example um, didn't have an organism in them um, 30 years ago that, it, that they do now and uh, so we just have to keep up with that it's the responsibility of FDA and other uh, of the agencies dealing with food safety to convey that information to the public and also to do our job of enforcing food safety standards. What uh, causes the organisms to develop this way? Uh, you just cited an example. Well, uh, I'll ask Dr. Murano, who is certainly an expert in this area. Uh, the, the organisms evolve or mutate um, and they have been doing that, of course, since time began. And uh, so they change in some, some form or another to make them more dangerous to humans. The other thing that happens is, is that they enter a new species of animal. Like uh, we have a form of salmonella that now is prominent in eggs. That was not the case many years ago called salmonella enteritidis. So they find what we call a new niche. Uh, and they also evolve. And, um, and then organisms like viruses that have never been detected before all of a sudden just appear. And uh, maybe they, they were here all along and in another niche, but also they could have just evolved. 
Well, thank you. We will now get to the last presenter, which is Mary uh, Klatko, and she's the food service director at the Howard County Schools in Howard County, Maryland. Amer and she's speaking here for the American School Food Service Association. Mr. Horn, I am Mary Klatko, Food and Nutrition Service Administrator for the Howard County Public School System in Howard County, Maryland. We are a school district of 45,000 students with 67 schools located between Baltimore and Washington. I am also the coordinator of a purchasing cooperative which serves 12 Maryland counties, approximately half of the state, with an enrollment of 235,000 students in 375 schools. With me today is Barry Sacken, Senior Vice President, Public Policy for the American School Food Service Association. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about food safety and school nutrition programs. The American School Food Service Association is a member organization of more than 57,000 school food service professionals. Among our members, we count the directors of most of the 5,000 large districts in this country, <coughs> serving almost 70% of the school meals. More than half of our members have received ASFSA certification, a professional standard that includes having completed and passed a comprehensive food safety program. I don't know one school food service professional who is not deeply concerned about the safety of the food they serve. The concern seems primarily from our commitment to the children in our care. I am proud of the record we have established over many years, which clearly shows that school meals are among the safest served in this country. In February of 2000, the Government Accounting Office, GAO, submitted a report to Congress requested by Senator Harkin. This report stated in part that there were over 20 outbreaks of foodborne illness in schools reported to CDC during 1997 and 98. Eight of those were attributed to school meals and affected 1,609 children. ASFSA is very concerned about every one of these 1,609 children. And it's difficult sitting next to you, Tyler, knowing that you are one of those. Um, it just has, it really has an effect on someone to put a face with a name and a, and a problem. ASFSA is very concerned, but the numbers do have to be put in context. Each day at more than 92,000 schools in this country, school food service professionals serve more than 7.8 million breakfasts and 27.6 million lunches. This means that during the two years included in these studies, schools provided approximately 13 billion school meals as well as an unspecified number of other customers served through a la carte sales, catering activities, and other programs that many school food service programs run, such as Head Start and Meals on Wheels. We attribute this remarkable record to the care taken in handling, preparing, and serving food. Quality school food service programs emphasize food safety, and we constantly train and retrain employees in safe handling practices. The first line of defense is, and always will be, the people who handle the food. Part of this commitment includes training staff to receive food deliveries in ways consistent with healthful, safe practices, including checking for freshness, the proper temperature on receipt and handling, and that products do not show any signs of adulteration. ASFSA food safety training recommends that school districts strictly monitor food safety from the time food is received to the time it is served. The association offers Serving It Safe, a nationally accepted sanitation and food safety course for food service staff to help them keep their kitchens safe, clean, and sanitary. Marcia Smith, president of the American School Food Service Association said, our association has offered training opportunities to thousands of our members in order to increase their knowledge and practice of food safety. We consider this a top priority. In keeping with this philosophy, one way we think Congress can address the issue to provide resources to assist school districts in training staff. Also, many school districts are developing HACIP, which are hazard analysis critical control point based models for their food service facilities. This development is resource intensive, and it would be helpful and appropriate for Congress to assist in developing model programs and providing the means for districts with the best practices to share their processes with other schools. 
The Chicago Tribune article that has been discussed today cited the poor physical condition of some of the Chicago schools they visited, mentioning peeling paint and equipment in disrepair. Today, in tight budget times, schools are hard pressed to allocate funds for updating school facilities. A section of the National School Lunch Act, which was repealed in 1981, would have allowed Congress to contribute towards modernizing school cafeterias. ASFSA supports reinstating this provision of the law called the Non-Food Assistance Program. Mr. Chairman and other members of the committee, there may be schools in this nation where some of the negative situations mentioned in the Chicago Tribune article do exist. In a few schools, food service staff may not be certified or given enough training. School kitchens are frequently the last in line for facility modernization. However, most schools around the country have well-trained, certified professionals running exemplary programs in sanitary food production facilities. And most vendors in school meal programs are beyond reproach in their attention to safe processing and handling of the foods they prepare and sell. On behalf of the association, I thank you for your attention and interest. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Klatko. Uh, your testimony today indicated that the American School Food Service Association concentrates its efforts on recommending that schools strictly monitor food safety from the time food is received to the time it is served. I would like to explore with you if you have concerns about ensuring the safety of products purchased by the schools before they reach the cafeterias. This would appear to be the first line of defense. And how do you feel about that? How um, you can really do something with it? Mr. Horn, um, my background is in business and in administration. I do not have the scientific training that many of the people at this table do. I know how to handle food when it gets to the school serving line and through the process. I have to rely basically on blind faith for what happens prior to the food getting to me. I have not had any bad experiences with food handling or food safety prior to getting to me or when it has been in our school system or the other school systems I have worked in. Um, I guess I've been very fortunate, but I still do believe that our food supply is the safest in the nation. I do have to rely on Congress and the administration to come up with whatever you feel is necessary to make the food supply as, as safe as it possibly can for those of us who are responsible for feeding children in our program and for the health and safety of the students such as the one sitting next to me. Uh, in your testimony, you did not mention the guidance that the Department of Agriculture does provide to local schools on how to procure safe foods. What are your thoughts on that guidance? The um, National Food Service Management Institute does provide a procurement course. NFSMI is under the jurisdiction of USDA. I have taken the course. It is called um, First Choice, and it does teach practices that you should use when you're purchasing food. I um, learned a lot from it, and that's what help, has helped us with our cooperative. It has been, you know, very helpful for that to be here. I also know that there, that USDA has a website. I have used the website. I have been able to find information concerning a variety of things, including procurement practices from their website. Most universities have accredited programs for nutritionists and people that relate to uh, home economics. And do those people get training in any way to, uh, to assure accreditation when a campus turns out a number of people to go into the hospitals, into uh, nursing homes, and all the rest in terms of food and what you do with it? I'm sure they do because my prior experiences from school food service was hospital work. And yes, in, the, in my bachelor training, my bachelor of science training, I did receive that kind of information. I will tell you that in small school districts throughout the country, that um, is not going to happen. You're not going to have a person with that kind of education or degree. You're going to have people who are coming right from the community to work in these, this field. But there is ongoing training available through ASFSA through USDA, through the conferences that we hold, and the local health departments do have standards in many, many jurisdictions, and I know throughout the entire state of Maryland that you do have to have a certified manager on site when you're preparing food. 
those of you that stayed didn't thank you from the uh, government side. Uh, is there anything that you'd want to say after you've heard some very moving aff affiliation on what we're talking? Well, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to stay. We, uh, we're mindful of, um, of these situations, and of course, like Dr. Murano so elegantly said, um, they are the reasons that we're working in food safety and doing what we can do in order to make the food supply uh, as safe as anywhere in the world. Um, we need uh, a couple of more things in FDA to get that done, as I've mentioned before three times. And uh, but once again, that bioterrorism uh, bill does contain some things that would help us do our job. But let me assure you, Mr. Chairman, that the commitment uh, is certainly there to do everything within our power to make the food safe and also to prevent um, illnesses uh, such as we've heard described so well this morning, t this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Bodhi, uh, what are your thoughts uh, about being no need to re provide a recall authority? Oh, I, I have two thoughts, sir. Uh, one is, is uh, Tyler's story is, is, of course, very compelling. It's, it's especially frustrating to know that he got so sick and that that meat could have been purchased, for all we know it was, under the USDA Commodity Purchase Program and the specifications saying zero tolerance on salmonella. And yet E. coli 0157H7, an adulterant, while salmonella is, is not in, in raw, uh, in ground beef, um, was um, uh, present. Now, that could have been completely taken care of, completely controlled, had USDA specifications for that ground beef not prohibited the use of irradiation. That is an approved food safety technology that effectively controls pathogens, including E. coli 0157H7, and unfortunately, when USDA put their zero tolerance specification in place for salmonella, they also said, and you can't do, use um, irradiation uh, to help get there. And uh, that is a, a problem when we bar the use of recognized safe and effective food safety technologies. Regarding uh, with uh, recall authority, my, my point is that the, the food processors are very dedicated so that when a problem occurs, we have effective recalls. Now, we feel that mandatory recall authority is not necessary because we have an extensive body of experience with effective recalls being undertaken at the request of, of federal agencies, and many recalls are initiated by a company who then goes to the regulatory agency and tells them about the issue and that a recall is being undertaken. We feel that, um, I, I would also note that one of the issues that, that's been, uh, facts that's been used to justify mandatory recall authority is when a very small percentage of the recalled product is recovered. That's not because the recall was voluntary instead of mandatory. There is absolutely nothing to indicate that the amount of product recovered would have been any different had that recall been a mandatory recall. That is occurring because the recall was initiated relatively late, product was already out on the market for quite some time, and it was a perishable product. And that's been my experience in seeing where we have low response rates. And the overall key is to move more aggressively to good science-based systems to identify problems more quickly and respond to them more effectively. Uh, Dr. Morano, how do you respond to Mr. Bodie's point on irradiation? Well, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here next to uh, the Roberts family, and had that beef been irradiated, he would not have been sick. Uh, we know that. And it is frustrating for me as a microbiologist who studied um, 
several decontamination strategies as a researcher uh, back at Iowa State University and at Texas A&M University. When I know that there are um, methods out there, if you will, that will, uh, in, in a sense, make the food safer, and if we don't avail ourselves of it, uh, we are doing a disservice to, to consumers. Um, I'd like to, to end my comments, if I will, by um, restating what I, um, I think needs to be said, which is the fact that FSIS, uh, certainly USDA, is um, committed to enforcing their regulations. Um, that's what we do every day. Uh, we shut down plants as, as required uh, by law when we find that sanitation is not uh, adequate, when we find that the plants are not following uh, their HACCP programs uh, adequately. I, I, I know that the issue of, um, um, of supreme beef has been brought up and, and uh, somebody mistakenly asserted, and I'm not sure who it was, um, that we are no longer able to, uh, to shut down plants and that we're not testing for salmonella and so forth and so on. And, and I'm here to tell you that we, we are continuing to test for salmonella as we always did, but we're using the salmonella test as a verification of what the plant is actually doing. Again, we know from science that it's not testing that's going to um, ensure food safety, is what the plant actually does in the process. It's the steps that the plant actually is taking to control the hazards. Hazard control is the key, and this is what we work every day at meat and poultry plants to make sure that it's happening. And when it does not happen, we take enforcement action and take it swiftly and have continued to do so um, after the Supreme Beef decision, and we'll continue to do that. Could I, could I make a point? Certainly. Uh, it, it, Mr. Dyson. You had asked the question of, any government witness had a response or, or a comment, and I would like to offer a couple of comments, if I may. Firstly, on recall uh, authority and, and the, rec the government's record on recall, we issued a report in August of 2000, uh, which one of our objectives was to look at how timely our federal government recalls. And quite frankly, we could not determine that because the government, USDA and FDA, did not keep records in terms of how timely their recalls the ones that they voluntarily asked firms to conduct uh, were, were uh, how, well, how promptly they took place because USDA and FDA at that time did not tell companies uh, how to, uh, what, what time frames they expected them to act. Plus, they didn't keep records in terms of uh, tracking the, the extent and the timeliness of recalls, although FDA officials did uh, from rec, from memory, they told us that nine recalls out of 3,000 they remembered were not timely, and we document that. Um, and we had a set of recommendations to, to get better data on the extent of timeliness of recalls. The other point I wanted to make, one other point is on, we, several witnesses referred to our earlier report in terms of the number of school outbreaks in 1997 as being 20. In our latest testimony, we updated that, and now CDC has revised that data to 39. But the really important point is that both those figures clearly understate the severity of the problem. We all know that outbreaks are just a tip of the iceberg, iceberg because we have 76 million cases of illnesses, while these 39 outbreaks only represent about 2,000. But even if you look at all the other outbreaks, 767 in 1997, that only caused 16,000. But we're not talking about millions of illnesses which are occurring. So outbreak data is important, but it, in some respects, it, it really diminishes uh, uh, the, the, the extent of the problem unfairly. Uh, one final point uh, Mr. Bodie made concerning single food safety agency. Um, he mentioned that really the problem is overlapping jurisdiction. Well, you, if you look around the government, you'll find many cases where agencies have overlapping jurisdiction, but generally there is some logical reason for it. In this case, I really don't believe there is a logical reason for it, and I think we can make a change. Uh, Mr. Dickman, if uh, you have looked at these bills and uh, the idea of moving information to people that need it but haven't been receiving to it, 
do you think the senator's bill and the representative's bill, which is the House version, and uh, do you think that'll solve the problem? Well, I think they're clearly in the right direction. And as I indicated earlier, I would like to have a chance to answer that for the record, if I may. Okay. Without objection, Mr. Chairman, we'll put this in the record at this point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and I apologize for stepping out for a few moments, but we're trying to juggle schedules, as I'm sure everybody in the room is, too. Um, and I, I, I wanted to, even though he's not sworn under oath, we're going to take a chance here and ask Tyler Roberts, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Are you? Yeah. Got any long-term problems from this terrible experience? Well, I uh, still have protein in my urine, but we don't know until. So I, I'm sh I should be fine, but. Good. And how about your eating habits? Have they changed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how they've changed. Uh, well, uh, if I if I do have ham a hamburger, it has to be cooked by my dad. When we know it's cooked safe, because I, I mean I can't. I just won't take a chance. How about restaurants? Do you order hamburgers at restaurants? Haven't in a while. Yeah. Not in a long time. Understood. Because dad's not cooking, right? Right. Well, thank you for being here today, and Ms. Roberts, thank you very much. And I'm sorry Ms. Donath had to leave, but uh, between the two of you, uh, you really have put a human face on this. We talk about statistics and 80-year-old agencies, and we forget about the kids that really go through this. And Mr. Bodie, let me, I, I just, I, I'm really kind of at a loss, and that's something for a senator, huh? $500 billion U.S. food processing industry. What we're talking about is taking an 80-year-old-plus system that has been cobbled together and condemned for 40 years, finally turn it into one single scientific food agency that would give people more confidence in the product you make. And every time we have a hearing, you come in and tell us, this is, the, this is an awful idea. This is a terrible idea. And you suggest that we're going to put under one roof all these different standards and laws and just call them the new agency. Trust me, the bill doesn't do that. That's not our intention. Why are the national food processors so afraid of change? Why are you afraid to come into the 21st century and use science? Why are you afraid to walk away from the old politics and the old chairman and the old agencies and do something that really is thoughtful and really looks ahead? What is it that you're afraid of? Senator Durbin, the food processors aren't afraid of a thing that is science-based, and uh, rational in its approach. And that is our big objective. Is with this, all due, res with all due respect, we didn't say awful. I didn't say terrible. But is this rational? Is our current system rational? I, I, I certainly am not here to tell you that we feel this was the ideal way to design a food safety system. Is the I current didn't want to system give that either impression. rational or science-based? Can we, you say either of those things on the record under oath? I, I, I think it is historically based. It is not the way we would design a, a scientific, uh, rational system from scratch today. Most certainly it is not. It is. And why uh, do I, you defend it? Why are you so afraid to sir, change it? Sir, our, our point is that merging the agencies to form a single food agency is not going to change these issues that we have talked about in food safety. Trust I, me for a second. We are not going to just change the name on the door. We're not going to put them in a new building and keep these same laws that are so crazy. We have to go to a science-based system and one agency that eliminates the duplication and the craziness. And the food processors Why have pressed that? for, repeatedly over the years, have pressed for moving forward on science-based food systems, repeatedly have have petitioned the agencies for new regulatory requirements, uh, and that is why they, they are credited with solving the problem of botulism in this country. Uh, and it is moving forward with science-based systems that we support, and we most certainly support risk-based uh, inspectional programs. Let me just suggest to you that we can improve the current system, but I'm reminded of former Governor Ann Richards who said you can put lipstick on a pig and call her Monique, but it's still a pig. 
and we can go ahead and change at the edges here this system and make it a little bit better here and a little bit better there and yet we still have the FDA inspecting 80 plants for every single inspector and the USDA with more than one inspector per plant we have this crazy quilt patchwork quilt of responsibility when it comes to food and we can nibble at the edges and work on this and Dr. Morano says the USDA and the FDA are actually speaking to one another. They have a memorandum of understanding. There's a peace treaty. I mean, this is all well and good, but don't you understand how short of the market is? I, I do understand that it is uh, not enough that they're speaking to one another, and w we're thrilled that they are working together very effectively. Nobody feels the pressure from uh, problems in, uh, between the regulatory agencies quicker than the food industry and especially those parts of it that are driving for strong science-based systems. And our point is, let's be clear about what each change will accomplish. To uh, simply have a single food agency, our point is, will not make, uh, uh, cover the differences, change the differences in our food inspectional systems because those really go back to the underlying statutes. I want to You've got to change bill. those underlying I statutes. I want to send you my bill because it isn't just a matter of putting a new name on the door. It's changing the we, law to base it on science, and you know it is. I, I think you do. Uh, Dr. Morano, you said earlier that sharing information with school districts about the sources of food was not something you would object to. You think that if, if they want to have this information before they decide to buy from a certain vendor, that you think that's reasonable. Is that correct? It is reasonable. But um, again, Senator, I think I, I maybe have overstated it and, and at the risk of stating it one more time, I, I truly philosophically, if we just think philosophically right now, do believe that um, it is our responsibility in regulatory agencies to, to make sure that whoever buys food, whether it's a school for a school lunch program, whether it's a mother to make food at home, uh, whatever the circumstance, that when they go and buy that food, if it's meat or poultry, and my colleague will attest to the other foods, uh, that it is as safe as, as possible and that we have made sure of that. And uh, as, as far as information, certainly that's something that uh, if people want, um, it may or may not help them. The point is that to make a real difference, we have to hold the industry accountable. We have to do our jobs right. Um, and that's why I'm very big on, on even our inspector force uh, being held accountable for when they don't do their jobs right, because it is our responsibility to make I sure that we don't that. put I that on somebody else. I'm sure that's, that's all of our goals. It goes without saying. But, you know, what we... What I said to you at a previous hearing, I'll say again, the only people involved with the USDA who are for a single food agency are those who have retired from the USDA. Uh, as soon as they leave your agency, they're for it. And those who aren't in your agency, unless they're with the National Food Processors, they like the idea too. And I'm just hoping that since, as you said, you came to Washington, not because you like the Metro, but want to make a difference, that you will join me in this process. Let me address recall for just a second here, if I can. Now, Mr. Bodie says, and I'm trying to look through his rhetoric to what he's actually saying, the problem with mandatory recall is due process. Uh, I read into that lawyers. Uh, and being a lawyer myself, I understand it, which basically says you want me to have a mandatory recall of a process get, or a product, be prepared to go to court. And the second thing you said was mistakes in recall and, and whether or not there's a mistake and the USDA says recall a certain product and you do and it turns out it wasn't responsible. Well, I have to tell you now that if the current, if I understand the current system, the USDA waves a red flag, doesn't have recall, but waves a red flag and says we've got a problem here with some food. And what I have found is in most instances, the producers automatically snap to attention and say, bring it all back because we're going to lose consumer confidence and we may be inviting thousands of lawsuits. Well, the waving that flag could invite the same, quote, due process questions. The waving that flag could invite the same questions about mistakes. What's the difference between a voluntary recall and a mandatory recall when it comes to those two issues? Sir, I, I would submit that an agency suggesting to a food company that there are, uh, there is evidence to indicate that the food m is likely to be adulterated is, does not trigger uh, due process requirements. 
Uh, and that is what I hear agencies say to food companies on those occasions. And the food company response is immediate, as, as you point out, uh, to initiate a recall. I, I don't and, and that, so have, so that doesn't, it, because let me, I'm, I'm sorry if, if I was incomplete. If there is a mandatory recall situation, then you have a uh, authority for the federal government to require a recall if uh, it, okay, it deems appropriate. And start upon issuance of the notice, then there is a due process requirement that, that is invoked. And that doesn't have to be court. Of course, it could be an administrative hearing. But let, uh, let me, if you please. Yes. We've got Bodie Hamburger Company, OK? you got a big problem. You just put meat on the market, and Tyler Roberts is sick. And the USDA just heard about it. Now, under the current voluntary system, they call you, Mr. Bodie, and say, guess what? You got a sick kid down in Comer, Georgia. What are you going to do about it? Well, I know what you're going to do. You're going to pull back all the product you can get your hands on because they think it's adulterated and they think it's contaminated. Now, let's take it from a different direction. It's Bodie Hamburger Company. And you get a call from USDA and say, it's worse. It appears to be bioterrorism. It appears now that we have something contaminated in your product that doesn't make this 11-year-old kid sick for a year but could be killing people right and left. Mm -hmm. Now, are we going to rely on you voluntarily deciding to call your product back? Or should Dr. Morano have the authority to say, no ifs, ands, or buts, call it back or else? Which do you think is more important for public safety in America? I, I, I guess I would submit that the immediate response from the food company would be to recall in that situation as well. Uh, in in all my experience, and if but there were and, and if there were, well, but let's talk about what happens if there isn't mandatory recall. If if the food company doesn't respond, USDA certainly has the authority to detain that product. That product also can be seized uh, if if um, if the detention goes on uh, during the while that food is detained, USDA can go to court and say. Uh, we we want to seize this product. Wall, they also like they also can uh, go to court and get a, a injunctive relief from the courts for recall of the product. Mr. Wall. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Durbin. Um, the one of the big issues about mandatory recall doesn't always impact just the domestic industry. And and as uh, Mr. Dykeman stated, GAO has documented a number of occasions where recalls were delayed as a result of this voluntary system. But the real problem is with imported food. And in the situation you just laid out of this potential um, bioterrorist issue arising in food, and how, does, how do our government agencies go to an importer and say, you have to recall, but it's a voluntary system. We need mandatory systems to ensure not only that our domestic industry is in compliance, but that our importers are as well. Because while some of them, I, the vast majority, are upstanding, there have been examples with FDA-regulated product where importers did not comply with agency requests. And they refused to turn over distribution lists, and they refused to, to order the recall of their products. All, all they can do is, is send out a press release, but there is no other uh, action the government can take. I've gone over my time here, but I, I just want to close by saying, Dr. Morano, I still believe this is a power you ought to have. I hope you never have to use it. And to Mr. Bodie, I'm sorry, but using a voluntary system, there are good guys and bad guys in this country and outside this country. And if the national food processors want to defend all the bad guys, it's not going to be good for your industry. I just hope that we can take this hearing, which started off on school lunch, and return it to school lunch. Uh, there are some things that we proposed here today which I hope will move us toward a safer food supply for children in schools. Uh, that's what this was all about. It always brings us back to the key issue. We have too many agencies stumbling over one another in Washington with different standards, different laws, and uh, unfortunately, very little science backing them up under the current scheme. I think we can do better. I thank you all for joining us. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a tradition on our side of thanking the staff that uh, worked on this from the House side. And the uh, staff director and chief counsel, J. Russell George, is right behind me. Uh, President. Uh, Bush has uh, nominated him to be Inspector General of a very fine agency, 
and we never know when he's going to leave, and we'd like to keep him there, but it's up to the Senate, as you know, and so uh, he's doing his homework. Uh, Bonnie Heald, our Deputy Staff Director, is uh, back with communications. Henry Ray, Senior Counsel. Earl Pierce, Professional Staff Member. Uh, Justin Paul Hamus is our clerk, and he's always busy during these things, moving things around. And for the minority, we have David McMillan, professional staff member, and uh, we have Jean Gosa, and there she is. It's a great team over there for the minority. And uh, the court reporter is uh, Annie Hayes, and uh, we're glad to have you uh, do all this, and uh, we mumble once in a while, and you unmumble us. So thank you. Now, Mr. Chairman, this is like the credits at the end of a movie, and so I want to add at least two names, Emily Kirk on my staff and Marianne Upton for their work in putting this together. Thank you very much. This uh, committee meeting will stand adjourned. Thank you. Glad to do it. Yeah. Mr. You guys do have a strict standard for this, don't you? Thank you. To some extent. I mean, I understand the tenor of the senate returns monday afternoon and will continue debate on the andean trade act which would lower tariffs on products from certain south american countries you can see live coverage of the u.s senate Monday, starting at 3 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 2. Coming up, last night's annual White House Correspondents' Dinner with President Bush, entertainer Drew Carey, and others. On Washington Journal, our topics include America's vulnerability to future terrorist attacks and a roundtable discussion on U.S.-South America relations. And later, a speech by former FBI Director Louis Free on combating terrorism. On today's Washington Journal, we'll look at a study released last week on vulnerability to future...